So I guess this is it. After a long, 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 two and a half year long wait, finally Volume 9 has dropped. And it's weird. Volume 9 is weird. It's a weird, weird volume that's honestly just, it's just weird to talk about. A lot goes into this volume, and it's all very different from anything else we've seen from Ruby proper. From a crazy setting to turbulent character arcs, decisions story-wise that I just don't understand, it's all just a lot, and a lot of it is weird. So I'm going to try to break it all down into a comprehensive review, listing off things one by one to address their pros and cons. Because some things in this volume was absolutely amazing, some of the best the show has to offer, but other things in this volume are done so poorly and are marred with problems. And then there's, well, then there's the stuff that's going to be hard to talk about. As a trigger warning for this review and Volume 9 as a whole, I am going to have to talk about the topic of suicide. If that topic makes you uncomfortable and you would rather not watch this video because of it, I totally understand. It's not an easy topic to discuss, and the way Volume 9 handles it was... well, it's not the best, but we'll have to get to that later. For now, though, I think it'd be best to start with a quick recap of the story of this volume. I know a lot of people decided not to watch this one, either because they didn't want to support Rooster Teeth after it came to light how they were treating their employees, or because they just didn't want to spend the money to watch it on Crunchyroll's premium membership. So let's start this great big review by summarizing the story of Volume 9. The story for Volume 9 starts with Team Ruby scattered across a strange world called the Ever After. Despite that name implying this is some sort of afterlife place, it isn't. It's just what they call their in-universe version of Wonderland. Recognizing the fact that they are following the footsteps of the main character of the story the Ever After comes from, the girl who fell through the world, again an in-universe fairy tale, the teammates immediately reunite and spend the first half of the volume moving forward trying to get to the large tree. They follow various guides, both Little the Mouse and the Curious Cat, neither of which are actually very good at guiding them though. Each episode they meet a new character from the Ever After, overcome some obstacle, and continue on their quest until bumping back into Jean, who has aged to be a much older man. After he landed in this place, he was accidentally swept backwards years and years in time, forcing him to live several decades alone in the strange world as he waited for their return. It gets called into question whether or not the cat can be trusted, and then Neo appears to wreak havoc. Ruby, who has been in immeasurable stress and depression throughout this volume, snaps after being too frozen up to help fight off Neo's threat. The others snap back at her, which causes her to run off on her own, and gets bodied by Neo and her upgraded semblance. The faux copies of her dead friends convince Ruby that she should drink special tea, which makes her ascend, and the cat fuses with Neo because they wanted to go to Remnant. The others fight Neo Cat, and Ruby returns to them with a newfound strength and confidence, and they beat their foes. They all get an info dump on more lore from the brother gods and return to vacuo. So, long story short, they fell, and then in the end, they still made it exactly to where they wanted to go in the first place. Without a doubt, the best part of this volume is the back half of it. After the girls bump into Jean, the story really starts to pick up a lot. They develop the characters personally a lot more. They learn important information about this world a lot faster. The most important moments I think the show has ever had for Ruby Rose happens when she finally has her outburst. And if I could judge the show based only on the last five episodes, then this review would look very different. I truly think the last five episodes of this volume is some of the best writing, directing, animation, and choreography that they've ever had for this show. Unfortunately, they're still the first half of the volume. Episodes 1 through 5 are, at best, stretched out filler, with bad slapstick scattered throughout, and at worst, annoying, out-of-character wastes of screen time. I can say that my personal least favorite episode was the third one, where they do a chess match against the Red Prince. The whole episode is just a perfect encapsulation of how to define filler. Every conversation is stretched out, their dialogue is wavering and pointless. Episode 1 is similar, too. Honestly, you could cut out and expedite a lot of the elements from episodes 1 and 3, and then just cut episode 2 in half and fill in the gaps. Then they would have enough runtime for a whole nother episode, which then they could dedicate towards continuing to develop the interesting parts of the story in the later half of the volume. Like, at the end, when Ruby runs off and then starts off the next episode, she's just like, instantly runs 
turns into Neo in her dollhouse of torture, I would have loved to see Ruby being on her own a bit more, being able to express herself even further. Maybe show us the fallout of how the others are reacting to Ruby's outburst. But no, we had to keep this. Silence! You are in the presence of royalty! That's me, thank you very much. Another weird thing that plagues the first half of the volume is the lightning fast pace of the conflicts. So often the characters are faced with a dilemma, but almost immediately it gets solved. Blake and Weiss are caught by vines! Oh, never mind, Ruby is here to help. Ruby can't pay for the sword! Never mind, Little has taken it and they run off. Little is going to stay here! Never mind, they're going to go with the heroes. It feels like to me that they wanted to use every moment to play around and present wacky, interesting things found in the Ever After, which I do like. If we're in this crazy setting, I like getting to see everything that makes it so crazy by the hero's normal standards. And they do that very well. It just means that the interesting dilemmas feel tensionless and that a lot of those wacky things actually have no stakes involved. Speaking of which, the decision to have this volume take place in an alternate world and not even hint at the main plot of the series we left off with is baffling to me. All the important character development didn't need to happen in this Wonderland-like world. No matter what way I look at it, I just can't understand why the writers were so dead set on having this volume take place in the Ever After. It doesn't change anything, it doesn't enhance anything, it doesn't improve anything. There was nothing specific about the heroes being lost in an in-universe fairy tale that aided their development that couldn't have also happened in their real world. If anything, adding the Ever After to their already extensive lore only makes things more muddied and complicated. They add a lengthy prologue to the start of the Brother God story, and honestly, it changes nothing. It's exactly what we've already seen beforehand in Volume 4. The only difference is now they look like cute little animals rather than being humanoid. Adding this doesn't change our understanding of the lore. It doesn't change their mission about keeping the relics from Salem. It doesn't change the plot with finding the maidens. It's just additional lore for the sake of justifying why this alternate world exists. And they keep doing this. And I don't understand why. The writers have been stapling expansions onto their important backstory lore for years. Oh, you want to know the reason we have a story to tell? Well, first, there was an old man who gave four girls magic. Well, actually, there's an expanded version of that story to better define the four girls and the actual plot with that. And actually, way before that, there was two brother gods who made four relics. Oh, um, actually, there was also this whole thing with Salem being trapped in a tower by her father, and Ozma saves her, and the gods told Ozma to protect the relics. And they also gave him reincarnation, and he's actually the wizard from that first story that we told you. Oh, and here, in this supplemental side story, we'll give you more backstory on Salem and her father. Okay, so, and, and now, actually, way before any of that, the brother gods actually started out as little farm babies here in the Ever After. Before they did any of that other stuff with relics and remnant and everything. Stop. Please, for the love of God, stop. You don't need to continue adding to this story. You've already insisted on telling us this out of order across the span of 10 years. Just stop. We don't need another backstory lore dump. We don't need another thing to be, oh wow, magic is real? That's so crazy. We've done this. We don't need more. And worst of all, I literally feel like it only exists to excuse away why the Ever After even exists in the first place. And they didn't need to make it exist in the first place to begin with. There was no real reason this volume had to take place in the Ever After. They chose that, and then they got themselves stuck in this conundrum of now explaining how and why this magical wonderland-like world exists. I love books. Yang used to read me every night before bed. So, the thing with the Ever After is the girls discover it's an in-universe fairy tale of theirs. Basically, Remnant's own version of Alice in Wonderland. Learning this, adds nothing. It gives the girls a sense of what direction they need to go. They now start their mission by following along in Alex's footsteps and eventually learn that the story didn't actually pan out exactly as the story had said. We see things have changed since she was here, which sets up the idea of ascension. Ascension is when an ever after entity goes to the tree or dies. They can be reborn into something new to better serve their purpose. We get told Alex's story as Team Ruby are going on their adventure, so we can't even anticipate 
anticipate what their next steps will be on this journey. If we had seen this story before, it would have helped build up the hype for this volume. Oh boy, I can't wait to see what the Rust and Knight is going to be like. Oh, I wonder how they're going to animate the Curious Cat. I wonder what the Red King will be like. Instead, Blake does all that fawning on her own, and that's it. While it is a very nice touch to hint towards her history as an avid book reader, I lament the fact that I can't be hyped up with her. The various twists and turns would have landed a lot better if I knew what to expect. For example, Blake says this about the Jinxie Peddler. And a lot older than I remember from the book. That just means nothing to me. I don't know what Jinxie is supposed to look like, so the impact of them seeming older doesn't hit as hard as it should. Let us use a real fairy tale from our real world as an example. In Peter Pan, we all know about Captain Hook, and we all generally recognize him to kind of look like this. If we were suddenly faced with a much, much older man, with a gray beard and everything, we all might register that something isn't quite right. Jinxie's age is a minor and ultimately irrelevant point, but it's those little things that makes me wish I knew the story so it could have some impact on me. The betrayal of Alex and the cat would have hurt a lot more if I had a preconceived understanding of how the story is supposed to play out. Hell, by the end of the volume, I'm still not totally sure what the actual story was supposed to be like. The morals of those old stories are so simplistic. Sure, but what was the moral? What lesson did Alex learn? The team explains that Alex showed up and kind of just ruined things as she explored. Alex didn't know their customs and ended up starting a war among the townsfolk, but she was kind of a mean person, right? She lied and cheated her way through most of the book. We're doing the same thing Alex did. We're ruining everything. Well, that sounds pretty dang serious to end up having a simplistic moral lesson. Is the moral, don't mess up what doesn't belong to you? Is it, be mindful of other people's cultures if you're in a strange land? Is it don't travel too far from home? Is it don't start wars? I don't know. Later in episode six, Jean says this. She wasn't just a little petulant or inconsiderate. She was selfish, cruel. How? Literally, how? If her story was about her traveling around and causing accidental wars, what did she do that made her actually more cruel? I wish they gave us literally any sort of example here. As it is, it kind of just sounds like they're literally keeping everything about the story as vague as possible. So then they can retroactively write the story in a way that'll work around what they've written here. But it sucks because I don't know what's happening. I don't know who or what to believe because I don't understand the context of their conversations. The cat and John arguing is like listening to two people have a conversation about a show I haven't seen before. It's just white noise at best at that point. He lost all trust in us. Started accusing us of things. Why? Why did seeing the smoke from the herbalist make her change this way? The rusted knight drank the poison in her stead. What poison? The way he says this makes me think Alex got poisoned in the original story and instead he was the one who drank it. Does she? Am I misinterpreting this? I am so confused. What's worse is that it's never explained how Alex and Lewis got to the Ever After. Team Ruby made it here because they made a deal with a genie of creation to make tons of doorways that can be used to teleport across the world. And in the interdimensional rift between time and space, the girls fell off of his ramps and landed into the fart cloud looking abyss below. I highly doubt that's how Alex and Lewis got here. After leaving, why did Lewis decide Decide to write down the story of the Ever After and publish it as a book? And why did he exclude himself from his own story? It was said somewhere that Lewis's version was to write how he wished the story had happened, so he wished his sister ran around and caused a bunch of wars on her own and like he wasn't there, but why? <laughs> I feel like a lot of my questions are being brought up because the writers sort of shot themselves in the foot. They wanted the twist where the cat kills Alex. At least, it's very heavily implied. They killed Alex. The blacksmith even says this. When Alex's life ended, she chose to leave a part of herself behind. 
But if Alex was dead, that meant someone had to make it to Remnant to write the story. So they gave her a brother, so he can go on and write the story now. But Lewis doesn't really do anything. After we learn about his existence, his inclusion changes nothing. By all means, Alex could have managed to escape and write the story on her own, but I think there is an important reason why they wanted her to die in the story, but I'll be going into my thoughts about that later in this video. There's just so many unnecessary question marks now, all of which are made because they've insisted on placing this volume here in the Ever After. They decided it just had to be an in-universe fairy tale, but also decided it was a fairy tale we have never heard of before, and I just can't understand why this is the decision they made. I don't see how this has helped the story in any way. They tried to give us unnecessary answers to questions we never asked, but leave us with a million more questions in their wake. And we've heard of in-universe fairy tales before. There's a whole spin-off series talking about them. Why did they decide to ignore all of those fairy tales that the audience already is familiar with to come up with this new thing out of nowhere? Ruby is an action show. That's what it's advertised as. So let's talk about the action in fights this time around. One thing that really stands out to me is how little actual action there is. It took three whole episodes for a real fight to finally happen. That's the longest it's ever taken for a volume of Ruby to deliver a full fight scene. Episodes one and two have something kind of going on. They chase off the Jabberwalker, for example. And then in episode two, they run from the wooden soldiers after Yang gets her arm back. And this cracks me up. Yang runs from the soldiers and then is like suddenly out of breath, like jogging down a city block winded her this bad for some reason. Okay. <laughs> there's only a small handful of fights scattered throughout the volume, and there's not really much of what I'd consider action in between them all. It's primarily just the characters wandering from one place to the next, and action is just the brief times where they pick up their walking speed. As for the actual fights, I will say that they all look great. The choreography and animation during the fight scenes stays consistently high quality all volume. They give us some legitimately creative moves, too. After seeing Ruby's fights become progressively more stilted, characters standing around doing nothing, and things like that, this volume's higher quality is such a nice treat to get instead. I do find it a little boring that each fight kind of goes the same way, with the girls activating their semblances and then instantly winning at that point, which isn't exactly new for the show. I just wish their semblances could get sewn more periodically throughout the combat rather than being stuck being some sort of finisher move. Also, as a personal point, I'm tired of Weiss's wing summon. They were cool at first, but they've overdone it, and I'm just tired of it. Ruby doesn't get to fight until the very last episode, and I actually really like this. Not only does it serve her character arc, but it also means once she does get to fight in the final battle, it really stands out. And this is probably some of the best combat choreography for Ruby that we've seen in a very long time. It's quick, it's cool, it's smart, and we even get a cool mega combat combo move, too. The final fight might be my favorite of the whole volume. Also, each fight gets a whole song to accompany it, which I really appreciate. It gives each fight a distinct vibe from each other. Also, each one gets a completely different, unique setting, too. They don't really play around with the settings too much. The chess fight is where they play around with it the most, having the girls in the pawns jumping up and down the stacked walls of the chessboard. Unfortunately, the rest of the fights take place in flat environments, though. That chess fight is also so goofy to me, because this is the first fight of the volume, and for some reason, Ruby is acting so serious about it. Just so dramatic. Leave them alone! You're going to hurt them! Well, like, Ruby, you're huge. Just slap the chess pieces away from your teammates if you're worried about them, jeez. The other girls are all laughing and smiling and having a great time plowing through chess dudes, and Ruby's in the background acting like it's really dire. It's just weird. On that note, there is one element I think was really mismanaged. Specifically, it's in episode five. They fight the Jabberwalker for real, and then they see more Jabberwalkers showing up, and then they all just run away. I am so tired of leaving places in ashes. Yeah, too bad you're all a bunch of cowards. You're huntresses. This is after that whole episode where the whole thing was them proudly announcing this fact that they are huntresses. They have fought in several wars. They've plowed through tons of hordes of Grimm. Like, them fighting gigantic Grimm wars is a staple. It's been a staple since volume two. Hell, it's been a staple since the red trailer. But now, what, like, 
like 13 Jabberwockers are just too much for you, there is no way this creature can be considered any stronger than half of the Grim they've faced. So why are you turning tail and running? But your huntsmen and huntresses! You can't just back down from a fight! What's that, Yang? Is that you running away? Leaving the Afterians to suffer as you scurry off? Is this not what you said made Ironwood such a villain? Do you feel like heroes yet? Are you a huntress as you all run from a fight you should easily be able to handle? Interesting. It's just really interesting. <laughs> I know. What a surprise. Ruby has really horrible tone shifts. Who could have seen that one coming? It's a pretty well-known element by now that Ruby's tone is absolute shit. This has been a problem since the very beginning and has only gotten more and more egregious as the years go by. Probably because they keep trying to introduce more and more serious topics into the story, but then they still insist on peppering in the same old goofy slapstick comedy, which Yes, it's very true here as well. On the bright side, after about episode 5-ish, it stops being a problem. Once they run into Jean, the tone stays generally much more consistent and flows more naturally from one scene to the next, including the more lighthearted or comedic moments into the more serious or dramatic scenes. But the first couple of episodes, oh my god, it's horrible. Especially episode 1. Episode 1 is just a whole dumpster fire in terms of competent storytelling. Ruby goes from curled up and crying then to comedy banter with little in the span of seconds. Weiss goes from being too torn up to even talk about what's happened with Penny, to doing stupid jumping jacks and cheering on Blake like a plucky cheerleader. In episode two, Yang is literally in the middle of talking about how her arm got stolen, clearly frustrated and upset about it, but then Blake just starts laughing and apparently that means everything's happy fun times now. We get cartoony childish antics from the wooden soldiers while Ruby is trying to give an emotional and heartfelt speech speech about her dead friend, Jean tells us the horrible, sad, and tragic story about him being lost in time, just to instantly follow that up with the girls zipping around comedically and Weiss being big thirsty for him. Haha, -ha, so funny! Your friend suffered alone for literally years and has been through endless emotional and mental trauma. Let's make some jokes about that. Ha 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 ha, it's so funny! The worst part is the fact that it's mainly only presented in the first few episodes of the volumes, and that means it's really hard to get into the story. The the idea of re-watching the first episodes of Volume 9 sounds horrible to me. It doesn't hook me into their narrative because the tone keeps changing every two seconds. Ruby is standing there trying to be sad and serious, but the world around her is bouncing around like an episode of Spongebob. We talk about how Ruby's tone shifts are bad and jarring, not just because it makes it hard to take their serious moments seriously and it makes their comedic moments feel bitter and leave a bad taste in your mouth, but also because it makes the story hard to sink your teeth into. Bad tone shifts? kill the flow of your narrative and ruin an audience member's experience with it. After seeing how they execute their tone shifts really, really well in the latter half of the volume, hurts. It hurts because clearly they can do this. They can have really excellent ebbs and flows to the tone of their show, even when they have a comedic moment thrown into the middle of a serious scene. They can do this really well, so it's a shame that they failed to do so during the part of the story where your audience is supposed to be getting hooked into your world. Madonna, Blondie, Bowie, Beatles, music! We need music! This is music! I'm going to start off with the negative stuff because I want to end this section on the positive stuff because this is going to be my biggest point of praise for this volume and I don't want it to feel like I'm undermining that praise by ending off on the bad parts. So here we go. I theorized that there was a struggle to get the music done fast enough for this volume because especially in the early episodes, there just isn't any. It makes a lot of scenes feel really weirdly empty. It makes this world and their conversations, the whole show, feel deafening. For what? Nothing. It doesn't help that, especially the more comedic scenes, there's usually a pause between the characters speaking, almost as if there was supposed to be a whimsical musical cue to fill that gap, but there's just nothing there. A talking raccoon riding on a purple wagon filled with trash. Yes. Here, let me just add my own background music to show you. It's Gruz's theme from Zelda's Skyward Sword. A talking raccoon riding on a purple wagon filled with trash. 
Yes. Fortunately, it mostly seems to be an issue with the earlier episodes of the volume, so they knew to prioritize the more important and impactful latter episodes. The thing is, I find it such a shame because when their music is there, it's all really good music. <laughs> No flood or fire will ever hurt them again. I haven't been this wowed with Ruby's background score in a super long time. Certain songs here or there impress me, but this volume completely blew me away. I literally love every single background track this volume so much. Small thing, this is one of my favorite moments, it's when they use another background track I really liked from volume 8, which played at the very end when Atlas sank and became Atlantis. They bring back that soundtrack and overlay it into this moment when the characters are talking about what they've done to Atlas. So, what? She just- I really like this. Yeah, I thought it was very smart and very clever. <laughs> On top of the absolutely phenomenal score, all of the songs with lyrics and stuff also blew me away. This volume, Jeff Williams stepped down from his position as lead singer, songwriter, composer, etc, etc, which I am totally fine with. Listen, I think the dude is great, and he's made some amazing songs that I love, but also, especially in recent years, I can kinda tell he's running out of steam. Listen, how many songs can one person write that are meant to allude to fairy tale themes and also address the concepts of the characters while still keeping things fresh and new sounding? Ruby's soundtracks have all kind kind of sounded like soup after a while. But thankfully, stepping in to take Jeff's place is Casey Williams and her band OK Goodnight, who I love! Their single and Volume 8 soundtrack instantly won me over with their heavier instruments and more dynamically written lyrics, so hearing them take on this volume's whole soundtrack is amazing and it's so cool. They managed to make every song sound very distinct on its own cool ways. Like, Volume 8 had songs. <laughs> Yeah, they all have the same old tired guitar riffs and too fast garbled lyrics that you can barely understand. But volume 9, each song is distinct, carried by its own emotions and its own style. Inside. Without a doubt, everything music related is the best part of this whole volume. OK Goodnight is very different from Jeff's usual stuff, so it might be a little bit jarring at first to hear something that feels so different than what Ruby usually has as its norm, but I think it is a huge improvement. If you do anything with volume 9, please listen to its score and soundtrack once they come out. Volume 9 took longer than any other volume of Ruby to be made, taking a little over two years for its production. And in many ways, it shows, because the animation is some of the smoothest it's ever looked. Specifically, the squash and stretch on the characters this time around has a much better punchy feeling to it compared to what they've done before. Take, for example, this scene in Volume 6 when Oscar returns with his new outfit. They attempt a really stretchy style here for some of the comedy, and it does sort of work. It gets the point across, it's relatively funny. Here in Volume 9, though, they play around with it a lot more, and it looks a lot better, especially when we have the non-comedic uses of the style. Squash and Stretch is generally used for comedy, but I'm impressed RT has utilized it in a way to push the otherworldly feeling of the Ever After, specifically with the cat. The animation on the cat looks great. There's a fluidity to their movements that really elevates their style and character. It's not a super major element for the volume, but it is something I wanted to give specific praise for, because it does look really nice. Ruby's animation hasn't really impressed me in a long while, and every time I have been impressed, it was usually during the action scenes. This is the first time the non-action scenes has actually really stood out to me with their animations, and I like it a lot. However, it does domino into the next point, which is related to squash and stretch of the characters. 
so perhaps as a byproduct of their better grasp on the squash and stretch of the show's style here, something happened with a lot of their facial expressions. Nine times out of ten, they look fine. Hell, this is actually the most expressive and emotive they've ever looked in Ruby. Every single emotion is as clear as day on every single face, and I give them huge props for that. Ruby has been able to comfortably coast by with its less than impressive face models. Like, they're fine. They get the job done, but I really love seeing them push the limits of what their expressions are really capable of here in Volume 9. However, some of their expressions just look weird to me. Like a little too far to one side, a little too stretchy. There's a fine line to cross before your expressions feel like they're going too far, and this does happen a few times here. This one with Yang is definitely the worst one though. God, I, I just hate this face. It's so ugly. It just makes me think of how Sonic the Hedgehog's characters have their mouths on one side of their face, you know? I especially think it's when they're attempting to do a classic anime thing with their characters. Like, this face might work better if this was a 2D image. But here in 3D, it's just not working. <laughs> As a whole, though, the animation for this volume is a massive improvement. Most times when people praise the animation in Ruby, it's limited to just their fight scenes. So I really wanted to take the time to point out the animation of the non-fight scenes to really explain how I think this does look good. This is a very very good looking volume. A couple of ugly hiccups here and there are totally worth it if it means we get such smooth fun, fluid animations like we've gotten here. If it takes over two years to get animation that looks like this, then I think it was worth the wait. So, The Ever After is meant to be a weird, magical world for Remnant, which is already basically a weird, magical world. How do you give a fantasy world a location that can be considered an in-universe fantasy world? And I think they've really gone above and beyond in this regard. Remnant is a world where there's forests that always have red leaves on the trees, so making a fantasy setting that will still feel magical and different from that reality wasn't going to be an easy task. And I'm amazed that they did a very good job job with it. Each acre they go to looks completely distinct, has a really cool visual style. Hell, this wide shot alone sells the idea of this fantasy world really well by seeing that each acre is clearly sectioned off with hard lines and all have wildly different styles. I'm a bit bummed we never went to this candy world. It just looks so fun, doesn't it? <laughs> it also helps that they each have totally unique color palettes. So even the acre that, just like the Forever Fall Forest, has a bunch of red trees everywhere it still feels like a fantasy world, and I think it's as simple as just making the sky green that made it feel that way. Also, each environment looks pretty great. I think the jungle area looks the weakest, all of its textures feel really flat, but the amount of stuff everywhere is still very impressive. This volume took over a year longer than any other volume, and I'd be willing to bet that a good chunk of that time was dedicated towards just building all of the assets for this environment. And I'm so glad they took the time to make every location feel this full, this lived in, this detailed. On top of the locations, another element that makes the Ever After feel like a fantasy is the actual inhabitants of this world. Some are more creative than others. The hunter mice are kind of boring, in my opinion. Some of them have unique colors, and I wish Little was had something going on that felt a little bit more fantastical than what a normal mouse would have. I mean, just look at that one. They have green. That's cool. I digress. I think the weakest part of the Ever After is actually this fart cloud looking thing they fall into when they entered this world. I don't know why they chose this shade of green. It seriously just looks like a comical cartoon style fart, like Ambrosius kept his hot diarrhea stank at the bottom of his creations. Literally any other color would have fixed this, and it's such a weirdly gross introduction to this fantasy setting. Anyways, like I was saying, the world of Remnant has people who can become a bundle of rose petals, whose hair lights on fire, who can transform into a bird. Having characters that will still feel crazy and exotic to those people isn't exactly easy, and I'm impressed with them. From the cat's technicolor checkerboard pattern, to how their body seems to move more like an idea rather than a living organism, to the Jabberwocker's eerie, rattling movements, its haunting, echoed voice. Hell, even the more simplistic characters like Jinxie or the Toy People give this world a sense of magic we don't see in Remnant, and I'm impressed. 
I did not have this high expectations for them. There is one thing that I want to talk about, and this might feel like a bit of a nitpick, and it sort of is, but I also think it's something important to touch on. So part of displaying the idea that a fantasy world is fantastical is by having characters reacting to it. If people don't treat magical moments like it's something that blows them away, it doesn't really feel all that magical. So you need to have your characters stop and be bewildered by all the things they're seeing to properly sell the idea of the fantasy. The problem is, that's also kind of boring to watch, isn't it? Me, the viewer, I'm going into this show expecting to see something crazy and fantastical, so I accept the various magical things with stride. But to the characters in the show, it's meant to feel like them reacting to something really crazy in their reality. So if they don't react, it'll undermine the impact of the fantasy. But also, if everyone sat there and just hammed it up on screen all the time, it'll start to feel like it's dragging on and be tiring to watch. Watch. It's just a double-edged sword, and everyone's feelings on this sort of thing will be different, so I understand Artie's decision to have all the girls keep their amazement to the world primarily in the first episode, so then we can keep moving forward with the adventure. Yeah, they're kind of startled and amazed by certain things, like the herbalist for example, but to set up the magical idea that they're in a fairy tale means they had to be amazed by something in episode 1, and I think everyone's reactions were handled very poorly. Ruby gets stuck in a weird, infinite time loop, seemingly, and her only reaction seems to be annoyance. Weirdly enough, she has no reaction whatsoever to the giant bird screaming loudly next to her. Oh, but then once the very normal looking mouse starts to talk, whoa, that's so crazy. But then the immediate follow-up has Weiss and Blake being captured by the hunter mice, and they have basically no reaction whatsoever. Are they talking? Not what I'm worried about right now. Yeah, going from Ruby screaming her head off to Blake and Weiss' general disinterest is kind of weird, but then they do the weirdest thing with Yang's reaction to it. Seem trustworthy. Uh, Ruby? What is that? By this point, Yang has seen her arm being stolen from a talking raccoon and has also chased down the Jabberwalker. But once again, it's the little talking mouse that has everyone so confounded. It's just confusing to me that all of the girls' reactions were to the talking mice, when, quite frankly, they're one of the least interesting things about this fantasy world. The toy people alone is way more crazy, but Team Ruby kind of just roll on past them without much of a thought. Regardless of that, though, I do love the style of this world. Every location, every character, they've nailed the feeling of an in-universe fairy tale, which quite frankly I didn't think they could do. I'm so glad I was wrong. But just because I really like the design of the Ever After, there is one thing about this whole scenario that I do have an issue with. Anything you can do, I can do better. Okay, so the thing that made Ruby a lot of fun was how it took inspiration from fairy tales and stories. The unique ways they would reinterpret elements from those fairy tales to a very clever design element for a character. Ruby isn't just Red Riding Hood. She doesn't carry around a basket of treats to see her grandmother. Yang isn't just Goldilocks. She doesn't break into people's houses to eat all their porridge and sleep in their beds. But the Ever After is just Wonderland. And it's so bland and disappointing because Wonderland is so unique and has such creative aspects that could make such neat characters. Not even just remnant characters, but even with this in-universe fairy tale. But a lot of it, unfortunately, just feels very lazy instead. Oh hey look, it's my original character, the Cheery Cat. What's that? It's just the Cheshire Cat? No, 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 silly. See how the colors are a different shade of pink? See how the stripes are diamond shaped now? It's my own original character, yes sir. No lazy copying to be found here. The curious cat is just the Cheshire cat. Little is just the Dormouse. Alex is just Alice, and they could barely even change her name to something that sounded more creative. Lewis is named after Lewis Carroll. You know, the author of Alice in Wonderland, and then Lewis became the author of The Girl Who Fell Through the World. It's so unique and creative. The herbalist is just the caterpillar, living amongst mushrooms and smoking a hookah and everything. That's just, you're just copying it. The Red Prince is just the Red Queen, talking about chopping off people's heads. It's just so 
basic, so bland. It would be one thing if they just copied the visuals of their characters, but they're also just copy and pasting their basic personalities too. Everyone's just generally one note, shallow renditions of their classic inspirations personalities. And it's a shame because the few characters who do seem to be more original ideas, not taking inspiration exactly from something from Wonderland, are all pretty interesting. Jinxie is an interesting character. His rule about bartering the things that are important to you on a metaphysical level is really fascinating. It's such an interesting angle for a character that I wish we could have seen a lot more from him. The blacksmith is also fascinating to me. If I didn't know that Ironwood was already the Tin Man's character, I would assume that's maybe the role she's in. And the fact that I know that she's not that makes her so much more interesting to me. I want to know what her fairy tale inspiration is because it's not a blatant copy and paste of something from Wonderland. So the fact so many of the other characters feel so uninspired just really disappoints me. It also confuses me that Dee and Dudley exist. Their fairy tale inspirations is Tweedledee and Tweedledum, you know, from Wonderland. <laughs> so it's weird that it's set up as if the Ever After and Wonderland are intertwined into essentially the same thing, but then there's also these two rando characters who don't fit that mold. Now then, alternatively, there are two really, really cool examples of utilizing Wonderland characters and how they've reworked both Neo and Jean to fit the roles of the Mad Hatter and the White Rabbit, respectively. That is actually actually super creative, and I love this twist for their characters. Neo's twisted tea party and her crazed demeanor is not only a fun way of tying important elements of the Mad Hatter into her role this volume, but also makes sense with her character's progression. I can look back at everything from the past volumes with Neo and see how this was easily the conclusion they came to. Jean is even more impressive to me. The white rabbit on his hoodie, Pumpkin Pete, has been around since the very beginning of the show. It feels like such a natural part of his design, so seeing him take on that role in Wonderland feels extremely natural too. His list of chores he has to protect the paper pleasers is such a cute, fun way to interpret the White Rabbit's iconic I'm late, I'm late mentality. Of all of the things, these two characters and how they've been sewn into the foundation of the Ever After and how it represents Wonderland is the best part to me. It's super smart, it makes so much sense with their characters and the established personalities, and I kinda wish they played into these themes more. If you have theories about who in Team Ruby could have fit other Wonderland characters, let me know in the comments. I think that would be super fun and creative to discuss. I don't Weiss, unfortunately, still doesn't really get to do anything this volume. I can't even say I'm surprised. Weiss hasn't gotten any substantial development since the end of volume 4. However, I do think it's hilarious that, even when literally the whole cast is stripped away from the story, and literally only Team Ruby and Jean are the only characters we can focus on, Weiss still doesn't get to do jack shit. She's primarily used as comic relief for this volume, which is fine, I guess. The comedy isn't always great, and it's usually horribly timed, but I do think Weiss is a naturally funny character, always has been. Though I do think it's weird Weiss is so persistent on denying the idea that they're in a fairy tale. What we've seen is improbable, but that doesn't mean we're in an actual fairy tale. Weiss. Honey, we established real magic like six volumes ago. How can you still find things like this unbelievable? That's impossible. Things have to die someday. Weiss, honey, your old dead teacher is literally still alive inside the head of one of your travel companions and your main bad guy is an immortal witch. What are you talking about? I will say though, this is the first time in a long while that Weiss has actually felt like Weiss. She seems to have her personality back, which is such a breath of fresh air. She's proud, she's snappy, she's haughty, and I love finally seeing this more abrasive side of her personality finally showing up again. She's been so twee and demure for so long that I had thought that they'd actually forgotten Weiss used to be like this. Even the little things, like how she holds herself, is spectacular when it comes to displaying her personality, and I love it. I've missed this. <laughs> I missed this version of you for so long. Kara's performances for Weiss hasn't been too stellar in recent volumes, but this volume seems like they pick things up a little bit. This line delivery is especially spectacular and really stuck with me. In the book, we are not in a book. 
And even if we were, we know how it ends. Right over there. I hope Weiss can get some substantial screen time again soon. We even hint at something in episode two when Weiss discusses how she has nowhere left to really call home. There's nothing left for me to go back to. Just like Beacon. I want her to talk about this more. I want her to address this issue more. I want to know what she wants to do about it. And I'm bummed that after this brief conversation, she doesn't talk about it again. I wish she could have gotten one episode just for her this volume. Everyone else got at least one episode. Ruby is the main focus for the finale, especially. John got to really stand out in the perils of paper houses. Blake and Yang got their big episode where they figured out their relationship, but Weiss gets nothing. <laughs> <laughs> finally! Yes, finally. It's been on my bingo board for years. I've been asking for real confirmation for so long, and they've finally done it. Mostly because they realize they can now monetize off of this, and they're desperate for your money because their company is tanking. But hey, at least they finally did it. The bees confirming their relationship is the biggest point of development for their characters this volume. And I'll admit, their whole confession scene is very cute. I really like the idea of the girls voicing their hidden thoughts and feelings for each other. But like, everything around it is just kind of off. <laughs> for example, the things they say to each other is like, like, not good, at least on Yang's part. Blake's words actually really hit home. I think you're an extraordinary person. You act bravely when you're afraid. That's good stuff right there. I can totally see how Blake would feel this way. When Yang comes in with shit like, I think your cat ears are cute. Okay. A bit surface level, but that's, that's just the first thing she says. What other wise words of insight does Yang give? You've got a really good brain. I like that you've never been intimidated by me. What? Intimidated by you? What does that even mean? There actually seems to be this thing, this volume, where they're trying to like retroactively change Yang's character. Like they keep saying things that imply Yang is this threatening, brutish meathead. Like how they have this line about being intimidated by her. And then there's this other line from episode one. Long blonde hair looks kind of scary, but isn't but could be if she wanted to. Looks scary? I'm pretty sure it was yellow beauty burns gold, not yellow is scary and burns gold. Regardless, Yang's lines feel surface level at best and like retcons at worst, which is so weird because the show has done a ton of groundwork that could be set up for this exact scene. There have been so many hints and moments, especially in the last three volumes, that could be used as perfect things to bring up for this scene. When I was always pushing people away, you still insisted on being my friend and making me smile. And when I was pushing you away and was hurt and confused, I'm happy you were always there to hold my hand and show me you were there with me. When I had to fight Adam, I'm glad you were there to hold me afterwards and help me realize it was all finally over. When everything was going crazy in Atlas, you were able to show me small moments of fun and made it feel like everything was okay, even for just a little while. I don't know, their actual dialogue just doesn't hit as hard as I think it could. Beyond that though, I'd say the more pressing problem with the confession scene is how it's presented to us. After running into Jean, he tells the girls that the cat can't be trusted, and then they realize they don't know who to believe anymore. The question of how they can return to their home, return to Remnant, get back to their friends and their family, is now being questioned. And in the Ever After, when coming to a crossroads like this, you actually are sent to a real manifestation of your dilemma to basically force you to confront the problem and make a decision. Oh, but not for the bees! Where's Yang? And Blake? Must have had something bigger to work out. What? What? Like, I know confessing your feelings to someone is a big deal, but they considered it more important than figuring out who to trust and how to get back home? Worst of all, it didn't even actually seem like it was a very pressing issue for the girls in the episodes prior. If anything, they've seemed closer and closer in their relationship than ever before. Even Weiss thinks they're basically just dating at this point. Morning. I guess I'll have to catch this episode. About time. Quite frankly, they seem like they would confess to each other on their own once they had time to sit down and rest for a second. Forcing them into the thunderstorm feels unnecessary. And also, I don't know, I think it would have been way more meaningful if they made the decision to confess to each other. Instead, the magical fantasy world they're trapped in forced them to be alone in turbulent weather and basically forced them to express their feelings. They didn't get the chance to adjust the feelings 
based on their own desires to confess to each other, the universe itself literally sat them down and forced them to do so. Worst of all, Ruby, Weiss, and Jean are learning super important plot details about Alex, and Blake and Yang are just excluded from the plot. They don't get to have meaningful reactions or thoughts towards who to trust in this scenario. As cute as their confession is, everything around it feels like a bad decision that unfortunately muddies the impact the scene should have had. Also, hyper nitpick. Super minor, very dumb nitpick. First, they can definitely jump over that. They've ascended crumbling towers. They should be able to jump a few feet to the center platform. And I wish they would have at least, like, tried to show us that it would be physically impossible due to the thunderstorm's magic or whatever. Second, and this is even more of a nitpick, so strap in. I wish the flowers that blossomed were different. Like, these are fine. I just wish, instead, it was intertwining purple sunflowers and yellow belladonna flowers. Get it? because it's their colors, but on the opposite flower. I think that would fit this world, and I think it would be more cute and feel more personal to them. Beyond their confession scene, Blake and Yang are only okay. They don't get to do a whole lot other than throw out quips or exposition. I do like the detail that Blake is the one who remembers the story of the girl who fell through the world the best, because Blake likes books. I legitimately like that. It's a really nice touch. But other than that, Blake's just sort of there, politely standing nearby, nothing special. Aaron's ex performance for Blake has always been really good, and she continues to deliver great performances here. Yang, on the other hand, seems to waver back and forth between joking around and having a fun time to being pessimistic and smarmy about everything. And I don't know what it is, but Barbara's performance for this volume is just so terrible to me. It's just. it must have gone pretty bad, huh? She just sounds bored or directionless, which is a shame. Even this conversation was, on the whole, rather tedious. There is so much weird dialogue this volume. Specifically, like, the character saying meta things that reference reality. I've seen people call these moments lampshading, so I guess that's what we'll go with. But honestly, to me, it doesn't feel like lampshading. It just feels like the writers are using the characters as mouthpieces to bitch about things. A lot of it comes from the cat. Here's a great example. Did that CL girl from the vital festival ever come back in a notable way? The old man and the boy share a body now? Ooh, well that's got some uncomfortable implications. <laughs> There's just so many characters to keep track of. Wow, that sure is a lot of very specific things for the cat to stop and address. You want to know why? It's because those are common critiques and questions about the show. RT and Ruby have referenced its fanbase multiple times in the show. This is nothing new. They've gone back and added dialogue that helps to retcon things or explain things away. But this is the first time that things actually feel like it's being done in an aggressive way. Like the cat in the scene is being presented as annoying. All the girls look pissed off or tired, so it's presented like these various questions are annoying and not important for them to bother answering. So it feels like Team Ruby is meant to represent Kruby and RT, and us, the audience, is the cat. We're this annoying, jabbering creature that pesters Kruby with these questions and critiques that they don't think are important. It might just be me, but this scene is not cute or funny to me. It literally feels like RT is telling us how much it thinks its own fan base is annoying. There's also this scene later on where the cat is giving us critical dialogue that explains ascension. You know, ascension. The thing that becomes an extremely important and pivotal part of the story's finale. This is our first time being explained what ascension is. This is where we get the most clarification around it. And then the cat says this. But... There was nothing about Ascension in the story. Of course not! Exposition is terribly boring. Even this conversation was, on the whole, rather tedious. Fuck you. Fuck right off. This is your stupid story, where you decided to introduce a whole new fantasy bullshit element to this world. You can't come up with Ascension, then act like explaining the stupid thing you've come up with is some tedious chore. It's a fundamental part of writing. It's the basics of storytelling. If you think ex position is so damn annoying. Stop introducing a thousand new magical MacGuffins into your story. Also, newsflash. Exposition doesn't have to be tedious. I can think of a hundred examples from better stories where we are being told crucial exposition about the world building elements and it's an entertaining and fun scene to watch. Just because RT writes exposition like characters reading out of a textbook, it does not mean exposition as a whole is bad. Or is this just another moment where the cat is meant to 
represent the audience again, because that's a big criticism about Ruby. The fact that 99% of it is characters sitting around droning out exposition at each other? Is this their cute way of making fun of that critique? Oh, you all think exposition is boring and bad, so the cat's going to tell you that. That way, you can't get upset when we don't explain Ascension good enough. Because the cat doesn't like exposition. Because you don't like exposition, clearly. There is one example of this that doesn't come from the cat. Instead, it comes from Jean. <gasps> Feels like I've been waiting forever for that. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up, Miles. You're the writer. You can't have the character you voice stand around and go, I've been waiting for this to happen for so long. You're in charge of that. You were the one teasing Bumblebee every step of the way. And hell, even just looking at the scene, no, I don't think Jean would care. I really don't think Jean gave a crap about Blake and Yang confessing their feelings for each other. Weiss should have been the one to say that, because she was the one that said the line earlier when they were almost holding hands talking about Yang losing her arm. John just said it because Miles is the writer and he wants to act like, yeah, I've also been always supported the ship, even though I'm the writer and I could have written the ship to be canon at any point in time, but I didn't because now we need your money. <sighs> the lamp shading dialogue just infuriates me, this volume. It's all so petulant and annoying and stupid and I hate it. Okay. The part when Team Ruby are in the caterpillar smoke cloud is, in my opinion, the worst scene in the entire history of Ruby. Oh my god, I hate it. It was so weird, right? Because Ruby has had a whole plethora of bad scenes, from horrible, ugly animation, to ass-backwards moral lessons, to lazy, drawn-out exposition. So what is it about this scene that I hate so much? Well, it's so many things. Let's get into it. First, it's ugly as hell. I will admit that the smoke cloud effect does look very cool and is very pretty. But then we're just sitting face-to-face -face with the original Volume 1 designs for the girls, and they look absolutely horrible. Oh my god, did a child build her proportions? I get the idea that she was the one with big tits, but her boobs are literally the same size as her head each. And it also doesn't help that her head is gigantic compared to the rest of her body. I thought Yang was supposed to be the big, strong, muscle-toned brawler. Why are her thighs these toothpicks? Why are her arms made of noodles? When Pyrrha came back with Neo's illusions, you can actively see that they went out of their way to give her thicker thighs, bigger proportions, because she's a super strong badass and she should be built like she could crush your head between her legs. So why did Yang get shafted like this? It makes her look like a lollipop like a demented stick figure with cartoonishly oversized tits. What makes me really cringe is seeing the side-by-side -side shot of the past girl and the current girl, because now it's super obvious that current Yang's boobs are proportioned correctly. So it looks like we're seeing the real Yang and then the weird porn parody version of Yang. Blake's design really just hammers home how slightly changing the colors can completely alter a design. It also hammers home how Ruby in general has become washed out, desaturated shell, of what it once was. Her hair looks so weirdly out of place next to all of the actual black in her design. And it just highlights how Blake hasn't actually worn any black her signature color, and any of her designs since leaving Beacon. The weirdest thing is the fact that her bow is a completely different shade of black than both her hair and her outfit, and it just makes her look like this mess in terms of color palette. Everything's close to each other, but not exactly the same, and it's weird. Funny enough, Blake's tits actually have the opposite problem as Yang's. It looks like she went from not wearing a bra to wearing a double-decker push-up bra for her Jessica Rabbit cosplay. And also, I don't want to hear any comments like, oh, well, if we look at the biology of women, blah blah blah, just don't. Because they are not real women. Real world physics has nothing to do with how the girls look. I don't care if, oh, but if we think about their diet and their exercise routine, no, because they are cartoon characters. They look this way because a person sat down in front of a computer and modeled them to look this way. And I guarantee you the creators didn't sit down and count out the girls' calorie intake and work out the regimen across the different volumes to scientifically decide how big or small their body proportions should be. 
agree. They did not do that. So do not use those excuses here. Weiss's model has all the same problems. Horrible colors now in this engine. Her tits are massive now. But what really kills me is the actual dialogue of the scene. Because this is some next level pulling bullshit out of your ass kind of writing. You don't have to go forward, you know. You could go back. No, we did this. To be whole again? Okay, so Rooster Teeth already has a bad track record with how they've handled disabilities. Ooh, Ironwood lost an arm because now he's less human and more evil now. That's the symbolism, that's real, they really said that. Wow, that's ableist as hell. The idea that Yang isn't considered whole because she has a prosthetic arm is also shitty and ableist. Miles, Carrie, Eddie, Kiersey, fucking lean in and pay attention. People have prosthetics in real life too, and that does not make them any less human or less whole. Pull your heads out of your asses. God, I'm sick of these people constantly implying that having a robotic limb makes you somehow not human, somehow not complete. Fuck you. And like I said, we did this plot point already. Yang overcame the struggle of accepting her new prosthetic very quickly back in volume four. Why are we just repeating the plot point again now? Is it because you realized you kind of rushed it over and you realized you probably should have had more time for this topic? Or is it because you refuse to ever have anything new or interesting plot points for your story and so you insist on just repeating the same ones over and over again? Yang hasn't even expressed any struggle with her prosthetic in like years. She put it on, said it almost feels real, and then was happily laughing and using it to make pranks and high-fiving people and stuff. This volume as well, not only is this proposition from Smoke Yang ableist as fuck, but it's come literally out of nowhere. You really couldn't think of anything else Yang needed to confront in the smoke cloud. How about the worry that she's not strong enough to protect the people she loves? After all, Neo beat her and she fell off the bridges. She's always been the strong one the one to take care of Ruby and the others. How can she take care of them all now if she can't even beat Neo? Or what about something relevant to this volume? How about the worry that Blake doesn't like her? If the matter is so pressing that the girls needed to be inside their own personal thunderstorm just to confess, why not use this moment to further build the idea that Yang doesn't think Blake likes her? But no, it's just her arm again. Ugh, speaking of Blake. You could just be human or just a cat. This is literally one of the stupidest lines of dialogue I've ever heard in any show. I can't believe Aaron was able to deliver this line without laughing her ass off over how fucking dumb this sounds. Also, this just feels like in-universe racist as hell. I don't know, this line? <laughs> makes me think being considered just a cat would be kind of racist for Blake. Every time I try to think of an equivalent of this being applied to an actual real life minority, it just makes my skin crawl. Also, you know what Blake wanted? Equality. She wanted the minority race to be considered equal to the majority. In what fucking universe has she ever sat down and went, wouldn't it just be easier if I was literally just a cat? An actual animal? A real ass cat? To be something simpler. Also the idea that Blake only fought for equality because it would make her life simpler is a disgusting oversimplification of the reason minorities fight for equal rights. And just like Yang, we did this already. We've resolved the fondest plot point back in volume five. Oh, Gira's the leader again and all racism is gone. Stop repeating the same plot lines. Stop. At the end of this smoke cloud adventure, the girls triumphantly stand around and insist they've grown a whole bunch. Well, when you constantly have them repeating the same problems over and over again, it really undermines the idea that they've grown at all. Instead, you could be a nobody. Could you imagine? Not a single bit of baggage upon your shoulders. This literally hasn't been addressed since volume two. And when it was being addressed, it was because Weiss was explaining to Ublik her convictions to change people's view of the Schnee name. And then we literally haven't talked about this at all since. Also, honey, no one cares. You know why? Because Atlas is fucking gone. I don't think anyone cares about the name of a kind of famous girl when there's an immortal witch flying around on a gigantic whale killing everyone. You're name? Bitch, we have real priorities to care about. Also, no one ever 
put extra baggage onto Weiss just because she's a schnee. Not even when they were in Beacon and people actually talked about things like that. The literal only time her famous name has ever been a thing was when they told Cordovan she was a schnee to get back to Atlas. And then that didn't even work. This is almost as bad as repeating a plotline for the millionth time. Instead, it's pretending there's been a plotline when obviously there hasn't been. You can't just play pretend with your fucking story, guys. You can't just imagine Imagine that this has been a topic Weiss has been dealing with this whole time. You can't just ignore all the things you've actually written over the last 10 years to instead pull this plotline out of your ass. On top of all of that stupidity, the girls' big conviction moment afterwards is garbage. Like, I get the idea that they have it all figured out, and then it really hammers home Ruby's uncertainty, but if you've gone through the effort of presenting these various stupid ass issues to these girls, you you could at least have them actually talk about it for a single second. Instead, instantly, all three of them are raring to go and have their lives figured out. So presenting these stupid propositions to them was not only dumb, but a gigantic waste of time. Worst of all, there's nothing much else in this episode. We could have expedited a bit of their dialogue in the forest beforehand to expand this scene. Or hell, I think it would have worked out fine if only Ruby was in the smoke cloud. And the others were running around the herbalist's shop as tiny girls trying to make sense of it all and try to find the cat to come back and help Ruby. But not only is it over quickly, their actual dialogue is the same level of trash as their smoke counterparts lines. Yang's lines are tolerable, at least. They make sense with her character and sounds like a good rebuttal to smoke Yang. If there's something I'm missing, it's not because I've lost it. It's because I haven't found it yet. But then there's Blake. A simple life wouldn't be my life. Big words coming from the princess of menagerie in her giant cushy mansion and her two family members who love her and care for her and comfort her every single step of the way. Definitely not a simple life for you, honey. My family, my friends, my culture. Culture? Bitch, what culture? They've been writing the show for 10 damn years, and there's not a single hint of something that could be considered faunus specific element for their culture. Hell, we barely get any culture across any of the different kingdoms. Just because you've modeled the buildings to have different architecture from each other, that doesn't mean you've suddenly written a lot of vast different cultures for your world. Things like holidays, ways of celebrating, different myths and religions, different mannerisms for specific moments, hell, even different terminology or dialogue or naming conventions. That is what defines a culture. All of Remnant is exactly the same as each other. The only thing you have that implies culture is how the buildings look and what clothes people wear. Don't have Blake coming in here and start talking about culture, you hacks. You can't just pretend you've written the show a different way. I am the granddaughter of a hero and the child of a villain. Oh god, just shut up. This sounds like you've pulled it out of your middle school poetry notebook. Granddaughter of a hero. Only in the supplemental material, Nicholas has never been addressed in the show proper. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if people didn't even know that that is Nicholas Schnee. This is the hero Weiss is talking about, let alone her relationship to him. And definitely not what his character was like. Once again, RT expects you to catch up on all of their supplemental material, because explaining things in their actual show is just too hard for them to do. Also, daughter of a villain. That dude's dead, who cares? Oh, and then we gotta top it all off with the big moment. And I am a huntress. I am a huntress. I am a huntress. Don't start pretending like you care about this now. You three haven't given a crap about being a huntress in years. Only two volumes ago, you became huntresses, and this was your reaction. After everything we've been through, I almost forgot this is what I wanted in the first place. It almost feels trivial now. Yeah, you definitely care about being a huntress as you stare at Ironwood like this was a waste of time, like this could have been an email. Hell, Crow had to go out of his way to tell you all to lighten up. You've made it clear you don't care about this title anymore. As we see the montage of Ruby living her best life, finally getting to go on real huntress assignments like she's always dreamed, there you three are, falling asleep uninterested and pissed off because you don't want to be doing this because you don't actually care about being huntresses. Oh, but now, suddenly, ooh, I'm a huntress. Shut up. 
It's just more bullshit you've pulled out of nowhere. This whole scene is a laughable mess, with some of the worst dialogue, horrible character models, and absolute worst retconning I've ever seen from the show. Half of it makes no sense, or is racist, or is ableist, and then the other half is them just pretending they've written their story differently. Yeah, the Ruby part of the smoke cloud is good. The questions Smoke Ruby asks actually make sense. Ruby's dilemma is great, and this is all a really great moment that helps build into her development and her struggles. So it's a shame that such a fantastic moment is marred by this embarrassing bullshit of a mess beforehand. I'm late. I'm late for a very important date. I wasn't thrilled when Jean also fell along with the rest of the main characters, mostly because I think Jean is overused in a lot of Ruby's story. I really would have loved to see one of the other members of the team get some extra attention this time around. Jean's gotten a lot of screen time and development, and once again, he gets to take center stage here in volume 9, while the rest of his team doesn't even get a single appearance this time around. I would have loved to see Ren or Nora get more screen time here, especially after where we left them off in volume 8. Seeing them forced to be separate from each other would be interesting. This could have been a great opportunity to give Oscar some much overdue screen time with Team Ruby. He's barely gotten to really even talk to them all, and this could have been a great time to do that. Hell, I think the death fakeout during Neo's attack would have hit harder if it was Jean who Ruby had supposedly hit, rather than Oscar. Hell, Emerald has only just joined the good guys. This could have been a great way to get her to talk with them and get to know them better, but nope. It's all just wishful thinking here. We get Jean. Once again, stuck with special little snowflake Jean. I was just starting to really like Jean too. He was finally out of his funk with Morning Pyrrha. He was happy. He was confident. He was doing really good emotionally, and it was becoming a pillar for the team to lean on. Finally becoming the leader he had always meant to become. But here? Well, now he's back to being moody and broody. To give credit where credit is due, the sequence where Jean accidentally gets sent back in time is intense. I'm not kidding, it literally kept me up at night thinking about how terrifying and traumatic that would be. It was all rather sudden though, like Jean landed on the island and then just instantly accidentally gets thrown back in time, just like that, okay. And thanks to this timey-wimey shenanigans, Jean now gets to be just like how he was when he was mourning Pyrrha. He's back to snapping at people, being a buzzkill all the time, and being just generally miserable and angry about everything. Truly, it's just a reversal for his entire character and I kind of hate it. Not only do I wish this could have been a different character who desperately needed more one-on-one -on -one time with Team Ruby, but also it feels like they've just hit the reset button on Jean's development. I mentioned how I thought it was really clever how they turned Jean into the White Rabbit, and I do really like that part of his character for this volume. I just wish this all wasn't how they got there. Because also, quite frankly, Jean aging a shit ton ended up being completely fucking pointless. He just goes back to being a teenager again. Why? It's so last second, too. It's literally the very last thing they do before they go back to Remnant. Why? You all decided to make Jean a 40-year-old, you could at least have the balls to commit to this decision, but nope, he's exactly the same as he was before. Except now he has a little bit of white streaks in his hair, and internally he's decades older than his peers, and I hate it. And here's something small for me that I don't know if anyone else will sympathize with, but it bothers me that now I can't ship White Knight anymore, which is Weiss ex Jean. I used to really like White Knight, I thought it was cute. I didn't really expect it to ever happen in the show, but I think it's a cute pairing, especially in fan works. But now it's just really creepy and I can't ship it anymore. It's literally the problem people had with Rose Garden, but like, actually now though. People didn't like Ruby x Oscar because, ooh, Oscar has an old man in his head and that's gross and weird. And it's like, yes, it is, but the people who ship Rose Garden aren't including Ozpin in this equation, obviously. But here, yes, actually now, it's a 20-year-old girl and a 40-year-old man. Sure, he might have been magically zooped back into the body of a 20-year-old again, but emotionally, internally, mentally, he is still a 40-year-old, and that's gross. And I know it's stupid to get worked up over a fanship, but you know what makes it worse? This. And when did you get so mature? 
Uh, remember what I said? I felt like I wouldn't ever become canon. So what is this now? What the hell? Why? I feel like the only reason they pushed out on committing to keeping Jean old was because of marketing reasons. Young Jean is more recognizable and is closer to the age demographic Ruby is marketed towards. That's literally it. And it makes the whole aging thing feel so pointless. And it all feels so unnecessary, doesn't it? Like, they didn't have to make Jean age several decades if they wanted him to still be 20 years old by the end of it all. I just don't understand why they decided to do this. Jean didn't need to be as old as Alex and Louis. Like, Jean plucked the time apple off of the tree. He could have figured out how to use the rest of the time fruits on the tree to hop around in time. And I think that would actually be a lot more interesting and make a lot more sense. If Jean was jumping around back and forth in time in the Ever After, he could have known Alex and Lewis and sort of trying to continually go back to figure out what happened to them, continually using the fruits to jump around but never quite landing exactly where he wanted to, so then he would have to use more fruits to jump around some more. Then after trying several times and still not knowing, it would make sense why he's so convinced that they died. It would explain why Jean knows the intricacies of the paper pleasers schedules, but also not seeing them ascending. I don't know, it's just like they didn't have to make him age. I really don't know why they decided to do that. It doesn't really add anything to the story, and it only feels like a regression for the character, and it gets visually undone by the end of the volume anyway. So what was the point? <laughs> There's a lot of decisions with volume 9 that just don't make sense to me, but everything about Jean is really the biggest thing. I truly just don't understand from a storytelling perspective. How did all four writers look at this and thought, yeah, that all makes sense. <laughs> this is a good thing for this character. I started it. Oh, Lisa started it. I don't care who started it. One thing I really hate about this volume is the fact almost every character is a constant whining sinkhole of fun. I understand Ruby's attitude being dour. It's kind of like a key aspect for her development this time around. That makes sense. Everyone else though? Cheer up for three seconds, please, God. I'm fine with characters being sad or angry or dramatic and edgy, so long as it fits and makes sense, but with volume nine, it just actively feels like the characters themselves are trying to ruin the mood of the show. As we're watching some cool, creative, ever after thing going on, here comes Yang to sneer and piss all over the fun. Oh, look at this cool new environment that looks so creative. Ah, oh, here comes Jean to shit all over it and act like everything's a gigantic annoyance in his life. The bitchy blondes are really the worst in this regard. John's angry attitude I can kind of understand. He's old, he's tired, this all would just be an annoyance to interrupt his day-to-day -day life, but goddamn it doesn't help that he feels like an emotional anchor for the team, sinking them into this pit of surliness. But Yang is the worst, in my opinion. All volume. All damn volume. It's hands on hips, half-lidded eyes, disinterested smarm out of her. Are we just gonna stand around thinking about this in silence, or? <sighs> Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. I... You see. Not even a little bit. Oh, good. Well, all questions answered then. <sighs> Guess I'd better go with the cat so they don't get distracted by a shiny doorknob and never come back. Oh my God, can you stop acting like a tryhard? I'm sorry, I thought you all stopped being petulant teenagers back in volume three. She's not even reacting to things that deserve this pissy ass attitude. There's no excuse for her development to have her being this way. She's acting like her mom told her she can't get an extra dollar for her allowance this month. Not like a grown ass woman who's trying to survive through a fairy tale. Can you not be amazed? Why is every single thing in this fantastical wonderland something that you act like is an annoyance? Just this brush off ugh, attitude out of you. Of all the people, I would expect Yang and Blake to have some sort of charisma this volume. With Ruby and John taking the role of traumatized put upon leaders and Weiss returning to her more sassy personality, you'd think the writers would realize Blake and Yang are the best options for bringing up the mood. But no. Well, unless 
they're with each other. Then it's all blank and yang flirt all the time, all smiles, chipper, and full of sunshine and flowers. And they're the happiest people in the whole world. Yippee! Oh, but then once literally anyone else interacts with him, Yang goes back to being this bratty Debbie Downer. I hate it. It's not funny. It's not cute. It's not charming. It doesn't make Yang relatable or whatever the fuck. It just makes all your characters feel like these sinkholes of fun. It really puts a damper on the mood when I'm supposed to be thrilled and amazed with this awesome Wonderland inspired setting and all of the characters in the scene are whining and groaning about how much they hate everything. Just why? <laughs> you seem to be carrying a rather large burden with you. Volume 9 gives us several new characters, but the majority of them are barely more than background characters. Folks like Jinxie, the Red Prince, the Herbalist, etc, etc. They're basically just characters who exist for the sake of having an episodic adventure, which I'm totally fine with. Ruby already has a lot of characters in its show. These weird Wonderland characters don't need to be grand developed figures in the middle of the story on top of that. Enough of a personality to give you the general idea of who they are, but brief enough to not steal too much screen time away from the real main characters. They're fine, they look unique, and are interesting additions to the Ever After. As for real substantial characters, there's really only two that are really worth talking about in detail, aside from the Curious Cat, who I'll address in the next segment. First, there's Little, definitely the most substantial new character introduced this volume, and they're… they're fine. I guess. Sadly, despite being introduced in the first episode of the volume and getting plenty of moments to pop in and chit chat with the others, Little weirdly feels like less of a character than the more irrelevant ones like Jinxie or the Prince. Mostly because Little doesn't actually add anything new or interesting to a scene. It's set up early on that they're acting as a guide for Team Ruby to help them get to the tree, but also immediately it's revealed that they don't actually know how to do that. You don't know? Nope! Never been this far from home. Which I think if Little did have more of an impact on directing the team, they'd be able to have more to say. Maybe be able to debate with the cat and be included in the discussion of who to believe, the cat or Jean. Instead, their addition feels empty and hollow, and I would think it's weird. Setting up a character as if they'll be able to guide us, but then immediately abandoning that concept? That sounds like a blunder, but I know it's not, because that's not what Little is really here for. Little is just here to be cute and funny. Whether or not you think Little is actually comedic might vary from person to person, but it's definitely what they're trying to do with them. What's really more important is that Little is small, and cute, and innocent, and sweet, and always chipper and happy, so then when they die it hurts more. That's literally it. That's why their dialogue is so empty of character. They have to be presented as purity incarnate, so then you cry harder when Neo stomps them to death. It's a cheap tactic, but one they admittedly do well. This is all they wanted for Little, and they executed it competently. Personally, I feel like if Little got to be more of an actual character, their death would have impacted me a lot more, but whatever. The mouse is there to be cute, to be a mini mascot for the volume, and now they can slap their face all over merch. Though, personally, I don't actually think Little is even actually all that cute, especially when we see them from head on. I think this model is actually very ugly. Aside from that, Little's other main purpose is to play into the main analogy made at the end of the volume, where after they've ascended into somewhat, we can reflect on how even a small impact on someone's life can have rippling effects on how they move forward from your interaction with them. For better, like with somewhat, or for worse, like with Alex and the cat. This analogy comes from the blacksmith. The other biggest character introduced this volume. And um, straight up, I, I love her. Oh my god, she is so cool. In all honesty, she's barely more of a character than the other minor ones I've mentioned earlier. The biggest aspect of her character is that it's presented like she's an entity that, to some degree, is akin to a god or has a godlike status. At the end, we see she has this collection of figures of all the characters and even the brother gods. She seems to be the only one in the Ever After who knows about the true or origins of the brother gods and how slash why they left. Hell, after Little dies, we can see she's building something that looks an awful lot like a mouse face, implying she's playing a role in crafting somewhat's new design. She's the one Ruby finds after ascending, and she speaks to Ruby to help her figure out what she wants to do, who she wants to be, and how she's going to move forward from where she is. Despite getting a lot of screen time to talk to Ruby, funny enough, 
all of her dialogue is in service of furthering Ruby's development, rather than setting up characterization for herself. Which I like! Yes, this is what I want! If we bogged down these scenes with trying to prop up the blacksmith and her personality and her history or whatever, it would have been a detriment to the crucially important development Ruby goes through. And yet, the blacksmith still feels like a very well-developed character. Their stellar voice performance, the animation, the word choice given to her does all of that heavy lifting. She doesn't need to tell us about herself because everything is already on screen telling us about it already. I truly love her. And while I think we could see more of her again, I think it would also work if she stayed strictly in the Ever After. But she's a lot of fun and really unique and interesting. Why? Why you're a cat! A Cheshire cat. We get two main villains in this volume, Neo and the cat, and straight up I love both of them here. I've been very vocal before about how I don't really like Neo much as a character. I feel like she was an unnecessary addition, bloating a two full cast with little to no personality. Seeing her trail around after Cinder feels like a dull decision for her development. So here, where she's finally one of the only two main antagonists, it's nice seeing her really get to actually shine. Her brutality is on full display and it's awesome. She's not the cute little twee ice cream girl the internet has convinced themselves she is. She's a monster. She revels in beating things, killing things, torturing people. She's a real tangible threat now. It helps that at the start of the volume her semblance conveniently gets an upgrade that allows her to make clones of things and other people, which I'm sure some people will feel like was a lazy decision for her to just randomly get a semblance upgrade, but I actually really liked it. The idea of semblance evolution is a topic I love hearing fan theories about, and the discussions I've seen around Neo's semblance changing in this moment has been fun to engage with. So please, if you have any theories as to why her semblance might have changed this way in this moment, let me know in the comments. I'd love to read them. Also, I have to admit it, this is a smart way of giving Neo a way to talk to other characters. When I first realized Neo was going to be stranded here in the Ever After, it was going to be one of our only antagonists of the volume, I was really worried they'd do something stupid when it came to her expressing herself. I didn't expect exactly the Ruby Chibi style of goofy signs she holds up, but I definitely thought it would be something similar. That, or in a worst case scenario, they would have just given her a voice through bullshit means. Like I said, they kind of have a bad history with ableism and disabilities. But to my surprise, no. This actually makes total sense. This semblance upgrade not only serves a valuable function for letting her express herself, but also makes her a lot more fun in battle. Using clones of Ruby's dead companions and friends is really crazy. It's heartbreaking seeing Pyrrha and Penny attacking Ruby, berating her for the things she's done. Everything about Neo's inclusion isn't perfect though. For one thing, it takes so long for the heroes to even see Neo. Like, Ruby mentions that she's here in the Ever After in episode 1, but they don't realize she's actively attacking them until episode 7. And I wish she could have had a bigger impact on the girls' journey throughout the Ever After. But that's kind of on par for the course with Ruby, isn't it? The heroes do things, and then at the very end of the volumes, the villains suddenly attack. It's been this way literally since the very beginning. <laughs> well, regardless of Neo being a presence to the girls, I wish we could have at least gotten a scene where Neo learns how the leaves work. Like, how does she know what drinking this tea will do to you? There's a big question mark in terms of what Neo was up to between her killing the Jabberwalker and then the attack on the paper pleaser's town. More importantly, though, is this moment. Offing Little Red can't be all you wanted. This really doesn't make any sense to me. She really has nothing left to live for. She is so much of an empty shell that she does nothing while the cat fuses with her because Ruby's presumably dead now. Neo literally had no other reasons to live. That's really kind of dumb, because I can definitely think of at least one very specific reason to live. Cinder? Cinder kicked her off the bridge. She betrayed Neo. Wouldn't Neo now want to get back at Cinder? Really? Torturing Ruby a little bit was really 
the only thing you had any motivation for living over? I don't know, this just feels lazy to me. On that note, let's talk about the cat. At the end of the volume, it's revealed that the cat is actually also a bad guy and wants to take over Ruby's body so they can go to Remnant. I'm cursed with curiosity. What a cool motivation for a character. Cursed with curiosity? That's so creative, and I love that. I love the idea of a character becoming so obsessed with meeting God just to grill them for all of the answers about life. That's a really, really fun idea for a villain. The cat also gets a really neat color change to their design when they reveal that they're actually evil, which I do like. I like these colors a lot more than their usual purples and blues, and I do kind of wish they had been color changing throughout the volume, maybe to match their mood or something, because the cat suddenly going black and white at the end does feel a little bit like it comes out of nowhere. Regardless of that though, design-wise, the cat is super cool. Motivation-wise, the cat is really interesting. When they attack, they're a really awesome threat, and their fusion with Neo combines the two together into one of the most powerful entities in the whole history of Ruby. And remember what I was saying about squash and stretch and facial expressions? It looks really good on Neo here with the cat face. As a final boss, I really love everything about these two fusions. Even the final fight, when the cat dumps Neo and turns into shiny Incineroar, it's fun, it's cool, it's creative. However, not all is fine and dandy here. All of my praise has been very centered for the end of the volume. That's because throughout the rest of the volume, the cat is leading our heroes on, acting like an ally. Except it feels like it wasn't always written to be deception. There are parts about the cat that don't make sense to me in hindsight. For example, they meet the girls. Specifically, they are first seen after Ruby reveals that they're human. And the rest of us are human? The cat knows they are human, and that's what they want. They want to enter a human body to go to Remnant with, but then they just run away from Team Ruby. Avoid them, especially in episode 4 after they learn about Salem and the brother gods from Team Ruby. You have asked about the origins of Remnant. That's right! Woo! Those two brothers! They still keep running away from Team Ruby and separating themselves from the girls, so by the time we get to this point, it makes no sense to me. I need to know why my maker has left me here. If this was your goal all along, why did you keep leaving Team Ruby behind? Later that same episode, the cat jumps in just in time to save Ruby from the smoke cloud. But why? Wouldn't the cat want Ruby to continue down this path? These questions about who she wants to be and does she want to be Ruby Rose leads directly into the same line of thinking she had just before the cat tries to take over her body. I guess we could make the argument that the cat didn't know what Ruby was seeing in the smoke cloud and that they just jumped in so they could keep Team Ruby to themselves. I don't know, just a lot of the cat's actions don't feel like they line up with the actions after the reveal is made. Anyways, there's one last thing about the villains I want to discuss and it's after the cat and Neo separate again. I think they tried to give Neo a redemption? She jumps in to kill the cat once and for all, and then she and Team Ruby have this, like, a moment, and then she jumps down and ascends, and we don't know what happens to her after this point. We don't know if she'll choose to stay the same like Ruby did, or change and become something entirely different, but I don't like it. No. No, I don't want Neo to get a redemption. No, I don't want to see the girl who curb stomped an innocent mouse to death and emotionally and physically tortured our main character to the point of convincing her to commit suicide to get a redemption. No, no thank you. This is really dumb. Just because you stepped up to kill the character who our main heroes are also happen to be fighting, that doesn't mean you deserve a happy ending. It feels like a bit of a waste with Neo, doesn't it? I wanted the rematch with Yang, but it never happened. I wanted her to face Cinder again, but that won't happen. She just becomes suddenly cool with the others and ascended, and we'll probably only see her again in some comic book or manga or some spin-off whatever. See the misadventures of whatever ascended Neo will become. I don't like this. This feels like a half-assed conclusion for what was a really pivotal character. Like they know she has a really big fan base, and they felt like they needed to give her a good ending so they wouldn't piss that fan base off. And I don't like it. I don't think this was deserved, and I wish she could have been defeated, like the villain she is. You can't give me her this volume where she's finally really a threat, a brute force, this horrible, evil, torturous person, and then suddenly decides she gets a good ending? 
No. You don't even have to be Ruby Rose. I know it sounds weird, but Ruby Rose is actually hardly ever the actual main character in Ruby. She's always there, obviously, but ever since Volume 2-ish, Ruby has been regularly sidelined so other characters could take center stage. This has been a major complaint in the fandom for a very long time, and now, Finally, we get Ruby as our center focus, and it's such a nice change of pace. Ruby, by her nature, is a fascinating character to be with. She's fun-loving and upbeat, but deep down there's always been this somber element to her. Here now, especially with her descent into depression with this volume, she's become incredibly interesting. She's finally really becoming a fully fleshed out character. She has dimension to her personality and has gone from this forgettable nobody to one of my favorite characters now. I hate the fact it's taken this long for the show to really give Ruby screen time and development, but at least now that it's finally here, it's done really well. Like I mentioned, Ruby's in a bit of a downer mood all volume, and she's the only character I think this works really well for. She's been the rock for everyone else for so long. Their constant cheery leader, their pick-me-up. Seeing her reach the point where she needs to lean on the others, but feels like she can't, is interesting. A glimpse at the dark storm cloud that's barely shielded by her optimism. We've been dabbling with seeing this side of Ruby in the prior few volumes, and I'm glad it finally gets realized here. Ruby's speech at the end of episode 2, talking about how Penny was once a great warrior, was legitimately the most powerful dialogue the show has ever had. She was touched by magic, and she gave her life for thousands, took a message of hope to the stars. It's beautiful. It's a fantastic delivery from Lindsay, and I haven't ever really liked Lindsay's performance for Ruby, and I think this volume is hands down their best performance. I hope we see performances this amazing again for future volumes. An unfortunate side effect, though, of Ruby's arc is that all of the other characters kind of become assholes in order to serve Ruby's development. The point of Ruby's story is that she feels like the others don't understand what she's going through, and that she can't be open and honest with them. This moment really says it all. She could have just talked to us. Maybe she didn't feel like she could. But in order for this to happen, Weiss, Blake, Yang, and Jean suddenly become these inconsiderate jerks. They actively abandon Ruby every chance they get. They bitch and whine constantly. Hell, Jean hands Ruby Crescent Rose, and they've all become so self-absorbed and stupid to realize that Ruby clearly isn't excited to see her weapon again. I feel like we could have gotten the same message across without making three-fourths of our main cast look like the worst people in the world because what it ultimately leads to is Ruby's breaking down point in episode 7, and it's all really, really, really good. Her breakdown when she sees the fighting sends cold shivers down my spine, and it makes sense. Yes, after everything they've been through, I would think the stress of it all would rattle Ruby to the point of being frozen in the face of combat. But the real chef's kiss is the outburst afterwards. The only thing about her outburst I don't agree with is her referring to being the leader. I mean, why do I have to be the leader anyway? Her being their leader has barely been mentioned. Yang questioned it once like a gigantic piece of shit in the beginning of volume 8, but then they never brought it back up again throughout the rest of the volume, and it kind of just feels like this comes out of nowhere. I wish the others would have been referring to Ruby as their leader throughout this volume to help make this part hit a little bit harder. But other than that... No time, right? Gotta help Jean! Gotta stay positive! Right? Get our feelings sorted out. Good for you. By the way, we're all so happy for you. Are we supposed to be mourning Jean's make-believe friends? Yes. Yes to all of this. Ruby has literally said everything I've felt. From commenting on Weiss's pissy attitude, to Blake and Yang being more preoccupied with their relationship than getting back home, everyone being too busy with their shit to stop and realize Ruby needs help. And then... John turns around. What about you? It's all about you! This scene makes me 
furious. It makes me so mad, my vision gets blurry. Even writing my script here, my hands are shaking because it infuriates me. It makes me so mad. I'm mad at John for saying these things. I'm mad at the other three girls standing around doing jack shit about it. I'm mad that the girls instantly fawn over John to help him with his turmoil, but has ignored Ruby with hers this whole time. It makes me so damn mad, and it's brilliant because that's the point. <laughs> Making me mad is what this scene was trying to do. This is a compliment. I know it doesn't sound like it because I'm mad, but it is. This is what the scene was meant to do. This scene has executed the delivery of these emotions so well that I feel exactly what Ruby is feeling. The whole point of this scene is to make me angry because Ruby is angry. And they've executed this perfectly, perfectly. RT and Ruby in general hasn't sparked this much emotion in me in a very, very long time. This is Ruby's emotional tipping point, and it hits so hard because of the amazing development they've been able to give Ruby. And all of it was achieved basically just this one volume. After all, there's not much else in terms of Ruby's development from the prior volumes, so it's just astounding to me that they got it really well here. And I'm especially glad that we don't end the volume with her still being in this headspace. I think it helps that she's gotten some really amazing conversations with the blacksmith to help her move forward emotionally, but also I just don't want to see Ruby being sad all the time. I'm excited to see how she's going to continue to grow from here. I've loved seeing Ruby going through this arc of turmoil, but I'm happy we're not stretching it out like how they did with Jean's prior similar arc when he was going through turmoil. Usually these things feel like they last three volumes, and I really didn't want to see Ruby being stuck like this for so long. And so I'm glad they were able to make it happen, execute it really, really well, and then have it resolve this time around. Now, I'm sure you've noticed there's a specific part of Ruby's journey that I've kind of skipped over. The part that goes between Ruby running away from the others and her talking to the blacksmith. Well, I need to address that part, but I'm going to hold off on that for a little bit longer. We'll get back to that in this video, though. People are going to ask, so I figure I should talk about Summer, but honestly, I have very little to really say. Finally, 10 years into the show, we're finally seeing some real characterization for Summer Rose. She's no longer just this ghostly idea that makes Ruby sad, she's a real design with a real voice and everything. The fact her weapon is found in the Ever After and the last story she reads to Ruby and Yang was The Girl Who Fell Through the World implies that she has some interaction with the Ever After somehow. Maybe it's the same way Alex and Lewis entered the Ever After, but quite frankly, there's nothing really substantial I can say yet. Clearly, we're setting up something that'll be addressed soon, probably in future volumes, but for now, anything I would have to say would just be speculation. Clearly, the most important part about this scene is that it tells us and Ruby that Raven was with her last, so now when Raven inevitably returns to the story, Ruby will be able to ask her about it, and we can get more information then, but like I said, for now, there's just nothing much else to really say. I will take this opportunity to talk about how I'm happy they finally gave her a real design. Her original look we've been seeing from volumes 6 and 7 was cute, but also admittedly very lazy. It's clearly just Ruby's model with minimal changes. Slap some bangs on her head, add a mom bun, fill in her whole outfit black, and bam, that's a mom now. That's summer. So much time and effort went into it, you can tell. <laughs> Going the extra mile to actually give her a real unique design is long overdue. Maybe even too little too late, but at least it's finally something. I can't say I'm excited to see more summer, if I'm being honest. Quite frankly, I think think she worked best as just motivation for Ruby, a quiet warning about the dangers of being a huntress. But as the story continues, it feels more and more like Summer is secretly some mega chosen important person or whatever. Salem knows her by name, she's interacted with the Ever After, etc, etc. I guess we'll just have to wait to see where this goes. <laughs>
these things aren't really important, and also aren't really enough to fit into a separate category, so here's just a collection of nitpick stuff that I had a problem with throughout the volume. Remember these people? Team Ruby sure don't, and the writers definitely don't. Team Ruby bends over backwards, villainizing Ironwood because his plan endangered some people, and Ruby wants to save all of them. Oh, but those ones just don't matter, I guess. They were expendable. No need to even bother having any of the girls mention it. In the story, Alex fell from the sky, got trapped in vines, bought a Jabberwalker. Wait, what's a Jabberwalker? That's a dumb continuity error. Like, I don't know why they decided to have a Blake ask, what's a Jabberwalker anyways? I mean, it's been established plenty of times by now that Blake was the one girl who was very well versed with the book. Also, wouldn't Erin also realize while recording her lines that Blake straight up points out the Jabberwalker beforehand? Here's another continuity error. If you thought we wouldn't come for you, then you must have forgotten who raised me. You didn't go after her. Not in the slightest. You fell. On accident. Everyone accidentally fell. No one wanted to go after Yang because they thought falling meant dying. So we set up the idea in episodes 1 and 2 that it starts to rain when people are sad. One of the toy soldiers even says so. This way! Somebody's sad! I'd be sad too. And I really liked this. And I thought this was going to go somewhere. It's something that they had set up really early on and seems kind of important, but then it just doesn't. <laughs> Episode 2 is the last time this ever happens. The prince's birthday sucks. For being advertised as a birthday party, I wish they played with that theme a lot more. Imagine if, instead of just a chessboard within a void, there was also like a bunch of presents that the girls had to run around while they were small. Maybe even open up the presents and use whatever random things they pulled out during the fight with the chessmen and the toy soldiers. Throw in a giant birthday cake for Yang to blow up, that'd be fun. This sucks by comparison. Are we sure they're not called the constantly annoying cat? Got him, totally roasted. I hate this line. I hate it so much. It just itches my brain in a way that pisses me off. Maybe it's Barbara's shitty delivery. Maybe it's the fact that I can't tell if Yang is being sarcastic or being genuine. Barbara's delivery sounds sarcastic, but the animation makes it look genuine, and her pose is dumb, and the line leading up to it was stupid, and I just hate it. I just hate it. It's just a weird thing. I just hate it. <laughs> just as a general with every fight scene, Ruby forgets that she has super speed. Just run from the Jabberwalker. Super speed away from the others to get to the parfait. You have super speed. Use your semblance. <laughs> what good is saving anybody if Salem just destroys the world anyway? That's how Ironwood thought. Literally no. Like, actually not at all. Ironwood wanted to save as many people as he could and guarantee their safety by floating Atlas as far away from Salem and hopes that she couldn't follow them. But in order to do so, that mean he'd also have to leave a lot of people behind because he didn't have time to sit around and wait. Either Team Ruby never understood what Ironwood wanted and that's why they decided he was a villain, or the writers have just completely forgotten what their own story was. When we see Young Yang and Ruby, Young Ruby just looks like volumes 4 through 6 Ruby. Like, it's just the same. It just feels like Ruby's way older than she should be in this scene. We've seen children in Ruby before. Why did they suddenly decide not to use their child models for Yang and Ruby here? I think it's a bit dumb that the others just stand around and watch Ruby drink her tea. Like, move a little. Have them be running up to her and just not be able to get to her in time. Don't just charge in and stand still. Here's a fun little scene only one, Yang's mouth does not line up with her dialogue here. But what if the cat was telling the truth? Finally, with the finale, there's just not as much emotion as I would have liked. Like, Ruby has, in essence, returned from the dead. The characters were just talking about how worried they were that she might be something completely different. And then she comes back with this awesome huge moment that looks amazing, and everyone's reactions are really bland. Ruby! You're... You're you! How? I don't know. Scream more. Start to sob or something. Sound happier. Do something. Be excited. I just wanted a bigger reaction out of everyone. Uh, we didn't even get an end credit scene. It's just a stupid trailer for their ugly looking Justice League crossover movie, which is very disappointing. <laughs> Anyways, now that I'm done with those nitpicks, time to bounce into the completely opposite direction. <laughs> If I'm going to sit down and spell out a bunch of stuff I didn't like, I might as well spell out a bunch of stuff I really loved, too. What did Jinxie want from Alex? 
Her saddest memory. And her happiest. I think the things Jinxie barters with is really cool and interesting. I would love to know either what were the memories Alex traded, or if she refused the trade, what did she do instead? On that same note, Jinxie asks Ruby to fill this jar with hope to trade for the green puppet, and this line... Hmm. You don't have enough, do you? is our first really big hint that Ruby's mental state is not sound. She's crushed, and she doesn't even have enough hope to fill a simple jar. Something younger Ruby could have probably done easily, and I love this. I like how the girls don't get fixed from being turned small right away. I'm glad this was a conundrum that they had to solve for several episodes. I adore the teapot lady's design. It is so cute. I just love it. <laughs> This market scene is actually really good. Ruby has struggled to convey busy environments before, and this scene really comes to life. There's so many unique things and cool characters, and there's just a lot happening. I'm impressed with the scale of it all, and how vast and unique all of the different Ever Afterians are designed here. I love the fact that the first time we see the blacksmith, they're crafting a butterfly wing. That's just like really cool imagery right there. It really sells the magic of this world. You named them? After your teammates? No, I name them after everybody. This is the funniest line in the whole show. Delivery is perfect. Absolutely. This a hilarious moment, 100%. Cracks me up. Oh my god. <laughs> it's a lot of fun pausing to read all of Jean's list of chores. I suggest you do so if you haven't already. Torchwick moving inside the painting is amazing. Not only was it a cool twist, but it looks really good too. I hope they play around with style and lighting and colors like this again in the future. I may not like the idea of Neo ascending, but I do like the detail that her umbrella is made out of flowers. It's really cool. <laughs> So, uh, this isn't really important or anything, but I thought it was interesting and I wanted to share. So let's talk about statistics and stuff. Woo! <laughs> there are four writers from Ruby. Miles and Carrie, who've been the writers since the very beginning, and then Eddie and Kiersey, who joined the team as writers starting with volume seven. Of the four writers, which one would you think wrote the most episodes and who would you think wrote the least? Well, the one who wrote the most episodes is actually Kiersey. She wrote episode three and episode five, and then co-wrote episode episode 8 with Miles, and episodes 9 and 10 with Eddie. The whole finale was basically all in her hands. I also think it's fun to know that every episode that had the blacksmith in it was an episode Kiersey worked on, and I wonder if that's why her characterization felt so well put together. It's been kind of hard for me to get a real read on Kiersey's writing by this point. I have a general idea about Miles and Carrie's writing by now after all of these years, but I've still been trying to figure out Eddie and Kiersey ever since they joined the team, and now I think I can finally really put my finger on Kiersey's strengths and weaknesses. Kiersey excels with emotion, emotional delivery, the body languages of emotions, not just negative ones or serious ones or heartfelt ones like how we've seen with Ruby, but also with the prince as a character who wears his heart on his sleeve and has this big, bombastic, emotional personality, and it really helps to sell the character. However, I feel like Kiersey doesn't do comedy very well. Most of her episodes have little to no comedy in them, with episode three being the primary exception. And the comedy in episode three really falls flat for me. I feel like it's a little too dragged out and the visuals don't really help to elevate the comedy. I know Kiersey has written several novels and that's probably why she has such a strong sense of displaying emotion and also gives them strong personalities. But comedy in a book isn't really the same as comedy in a visual medium, so maybe that's why it doesn't really land for me personally. Moving on, the next writer who worked on the most amount of episodes is actually Eddie. Eddie wrote episode episode 2, episode 6, and then co-wrote the last two episodes. I've caught on by now that Eddie is very good at writing conversations between characters, and also comes up with interesting conflicts, especially when it's an argument between two characters. However, while Eddie is really good at presenting these interesting topics, he seems to struggle with giving their resolutions really big impact. Things feel like they kind of just end sometimes. With both Eddie and Kiersey, there are often the writers who will introduce new ideas or have the characters say and act in different ways than what we've normally seen, ever expanding the characters from the limitations that we've seen with only Miles and Carrie writing for them before, which I really, really like. It gives these characters a breath of fresh air. They both seem to really have an idea on who these characters are, and I like seeing how they've developed them all over these last few years. Next up is my 
Miles, who wrote the third most amount of episodes. He wrote episode four, episode seven, and then helped co-wrote episode eight. Miles is very good at writing emotional moments, the moments where a character is at their breaking point, when a character has to scream, has to let it all out. Miles has always been the one who's excelled at delivering that power for these characters. In regards to episode seven, I think this is not only the best writing Miles has ever done with Ruby, but I also think this is the most well-written episode across the whole series. I'm not kidding. Episode 7 is absolutely phenomenal, and I have to give Miles huge props for it. From it's the flow of the tone from one scene to the next, it's the way the characters are interacting with each other, the mounting build-up with their argument towards the end. It's all really, really, really good. It's very smart. Well done. As for where his writing suffers, Miles' dialogue can often come across as very monologue-y. People don't so much have conversations, it's more that they just talk at each other, and it's all very clunky and expository feeling. Miles also tends to lean on past elements from the show a lot, which can sometimes give the feeling that plot beats or character moments are just repeating. I wish Eddie and Miles had swapped working on episodes 4 and 6. I think Eddie's skills with writing conflicts and the character conversations conversations would have helped the discussion in the herbalist's smoke cloud, giving their dialogue some real weight with his knack of writing new elements for the characters, and it would have helped deliver on the idea that they've grown and developed a lot from their past selves. Meanwhile, Miles, whose style often has the characters referencing things we've seen before, would give Blake and Yang's confession a lot more of a personal feeling. Last, there's Carrie, who only wrote one episode the first episode. He directed it too, and to give credit where credit is due, he did also co-direct episode 6 with Issa, and episode 8 with both Issa and Paula, which actually makes him and Paula tied as the directors who worked on the second least amount of episodes. The only person who directed less than them was Connor, who only directed one episode. Issa directed four, and Dustin directed the most with five. I think it's very safe to say that Carrie is distancing himself from Ruby. Miles too, I think. The fact that Carrie only wrote episode one and directed it by himself makes me think it was kind of rushed out. After all, the first teasers we got for volume nine came out a year before the actual volume's release. Nothing changed between those teasers and the actual episode either. So I'd be willing to guess that Carrie handled episode one, put together something that they could push out for RTX, and the others were working on fine tuning the rest of the volume. And maybe that's why there's no background music for most of episode one. Maybe that's why the only action in the episode is short and bad. And maybe that's why the whole script is just complete ass. I'm sorry, episode one is terrible. Episode three is my personal least favorite of the volume, but from like an objective critique point of view, I have to say episode one is the worst. And it's not a good look when that's the only episode you worked on. The tone shifts are at their worst. Weiss is completely out of character with her stupid cheerleading jumps. Every interaction between characters feels forced. Like Carrie didn't actually know how to have any meaningful conversations pan out or just wasn't interested in attempting it, which is why every important conversation gets skipped over or ignored. Also, the whole episode is generally just the ugliest looking of the whole volume. Everyone's actions are slow and dragged out. There's this stupid non-plot point where Weiss says this. Well, good news, I'm low on dust. And this is never referenced again. Not only has dust supply never been an issue in the entire show before, there's always been plenty of it around, even when they were traveling in the middle of nowhere, but also Weiss spends the rest of the volume doing nothing differently, never referencing her dust amount or anything like that. Clearly, she just says this line here as the in-universe excuse for the comedy of the girls trying to get Gamble Shroud. Because Carrie thought this crap attempt at humor was so important that he had to come up with an entire reason to excuse why it would happen. And then that got completely ignored for the rest of the volume because it wasn't actually important and didn't have anything to do with the real plot. It was just the reason to have hoo 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 look, they can't get the sword out. Funny, funny shenanigans. I was like, what? Why? It definitely feels like it was a rushed out project that only exists to be chopped up and used as various teasers to promote the volume proper. And looking at it that way, hell, I'm actually happy Carrie seems to be stepping back from Ruby. Miles and Carrie have been working on Ruby for a decade now. Ten whole years. Just like everything I was saying about Jeff Williams stepping down to let Casey take over for the music. Yeah, 
I bet Miles and Carrie are burnt out. I bet their ideas are running thin. I bet working on Ruby feels tiring by now. Getting new life, new ideas, new energy into these scripts isn't just a good idea, it's a necessity by this point. Anyways, I just thought these numbers were kind of interesting and it helps me get a better grasp on the pros and cons of each of their writers' different styles. So now it's time to transition to the culmination of their writing and really the true heart of Volume 9 and let's talk about what it's trying to say. So, what are you gonna be? So, it's time to really finally talk about Ruby drinking the tea. The climax of Ruby's character arc and part of the climax of the whole volume. Ruby, torn down and obviously depressed, runs off and gets tortured by Neo. I'm going to enjoy watching you break. Ruby gets physically beaten to a pulp, all the while Neo tortures her, tormenting her with images of the people she's met who have died, all telling her everything is her fault. How many more people are going to die because of you? And it culminates to the moment where Ruby, very sadly, says this. I don't want to be me anymore. This is so heartbreaking. Depression and suicidal thoughts are a hard topic to cover. It's hard to watch this scene because this hurts, especially if you or someone you know has been in a mental state like Ruby is in here. Have said things like what Ruby is saying. It's a tough scene to watch. It hurts. It makes my stomach churn. And unfortunately, it looks like that's exactly what happens. Ruby drinks the tea. Her and the others have been arguing over whether or not they think Ascension actually kills you. The cat, the one who's been insisting it's not the same as death, just revealed themselves to be a betrayer, Ruby has every single reason to think drinking this cup of tea will kill her. Now, I'm fine with a story trying to touch on a heavy, hard topic. Certain stories want to make your stomach churn. They want to make you uncomfortable, to better hammer home the seriousness of the topic they're addressing. However, after Ruby drinks the tea, suddenly the tone starts to change. Because the start of the next episode, the others run into the genial gems. There's uplifting music, and suddenly they start talking about how their death as the paper pleasers was a good thing. Just like they said, they came back from the tree better. Everyone's smiling. Everyone looks happy, thrilled even to see that the paper pleasers have died and now they get to come back as they say better. And then they get transported to the tree and find Ruby and carry that same energy. Whatever happens next, we have to welcome that. But what if she isn't Ruby anymore when she comes back out? Maybe. That's not for us to decide. During this conversation, we watch as the herbalist emerges from their spot in the tree, going from a caterpillar to a butterfly. The music is the same that we heard from the genial gems, and it's clearly meant to symbolize that this form for the herbalist is, just like they said with the gems, better. Now, I do like the idea that they say it's not up to them to decide what Ruby should be, if it'll make her happy. What Ruby's version of better would look like or be like. But everything around this is muddy at best. We went from being in an allegory for suicide. Ruby's words, her actions, her turmoil. When she drank that tea, it seemed clear that Ascension was an allegory for dying. But suddenly with the next episode, everything around the topic of Ascension is presented as better. Something they all smile at and think is a good thing. So you can understand why the message Volume 9 is trying to give is a little bit tricky to fully understand. Because yes, unfortunately, it looks like the idea of Volume 9 is that it glorifies suicide. The paper pleasers all died. They all drowned. Oh, but look, now they're rocks. See? It was a good thing. Their bodies get to be sturdier now. Dying was a good thing for them. The herbalist has ascended and became a butterfly. See? It's a good thing. He's better now. It'll be a good thing when Ruby ascends. She can decide how to be better. It's a good thing. This will be a good thing. Listen, the music is so uplifting and twee. It has to be a good thing. We should be happy that Ruby attempted to commit suicide because now she can be better. And no, I don't think this is what they actually wanted to say. I think they just wanted the idea of Ascension to be about change. After all, Ruby first addressed the idea of not wanting to be herself anymore back in the smoke cloud. Be whoever you want. 
You don't even have to be Ruby Rose. So like I said in my section about the smoke cloud scene, everyone else's smoke cloud selves offered them something. Yang offered to have her arm back. Blake offered to become a human or a cat. Weiss offered to take away her family name and be a nobody. But Ruby's smoke cloud opposite was the only one who doesn't propose what it is Ruby could be instead of who she already is. Ruby says, I don't want to be me anymore, but we aren't ever given an idea of what else she wants to be instead. Smoke Ruby talks about her failing as a huntress, and Neo's torture clones accuse her of being the reason so many people have died. I'm pretty sure the idea they wanted her to change was the ability to save others. To be a better, stronger huntress who can fight past the turmoil of loss and be strong enough to save anyone she loves. But she doesn't actually say that. Choose for yourself one who could leave your burdens behind, or choose one who would be enough to bear them. I love you. Just the way you are. What happens if I choose me? Maybe that girl is enough. The only thing Ruby encountered between lying on the ground saying she didn't want to be herself anymore and deciding who she is is enough was just seeing that her mother talked to Raven before she left on her final mission. Something that made Ruby angry over the fact she was lied to by her mother. Why would her mother's voice saying, I love you just the way you are, be the thing that inspires her not to change who she is? As much as I like this scene and I like this conversation, it doesn't actually answer any of Ruby's problems. She knew what she needed to be all along. So looking at the idea of drinking the tea, I guess we could say it's not an allegory for suicide, but rather it's that she decided not to do it, like deciding not to commit suicide. She faced the hard decision of if she wants to not be herself anymore and decided not to take that path and stay who she is. And I think that is what they were trying to say here, or at least closer to what they wanted to say. The thing that makes us all a bit of a problem is all the others who did ascend. The fact that their ascensions is only ever treated as something that's better for them. And I think the biggest issue about it is the fact that by the end of the volume, ascension is still very hard to fully understand. Mr. Krabs, I am so confused. Okay, so like, ascension is kind of confusing, isn't it? It doesn't help that the two characters who explain Ascension the most are unreliable narrators, the cat is a manipulator, and Jean is losing it. The first time Ascension is even addressed, it's immediately compared to death. Is he... dead? <laughs> no, no. Well, maybe a little bit. So we know that Ascension is basically like reincarnation to a degree. In the Ever After, if the Afdurians die or lose who they are, or like want to change who they are, they'll go to the tree and change. But it's specifically referred to being something different from death. Remember what I said way back at the beginning of this review, how I felt like there was a reason they wanted Alex to die in the story? It's because it's a really easy way for the cat to explain that Ascension is different from death. I know, I know where you're from, things die. So ascension isn't death. One way we can tell is the fact that it changes you. Like how the paper pleasers become the genial gems. Or how little became somewhat. But also, I think it's implied that the cat couldn't ascend for some reason. And there was nobody to send them back to the tree for a Jean is dead set determined on the idea that Ascension is the same as death, and to a certain degree, he's not entirely wrong, because while they technically aren't dying, they do come back, they don't have any of their memories. But also, apparently, you can decide to not change and you will retain your memories, I think. At least, that's what's happened with Ruby. If she popped out as a different person, we don't know if she would or wouldn't remember anything, which is part of the trickiness of this whole situation. We we only see Afterians who change their whole appearance with their ascension, and the only human we see who ascends doesn't. Everything about Ascension is presented as if it's a positive thing. We see the herbalist change from a caterpillar to a butterfly, which is a common metaphor for positive growth and rebirth and renewal. Little changes into somewhat. They are bigger. They can pull out the cheese from the ground on their own this way. They can protect themselves more now. Paper is weak and fragile and the gems are hard and resilient. It's all seen as good for them. But also, Ruby not changing is also seen as good for her. 
Emperor. The most positive allusion I've seen given to Ascension is the idea that it's meant to represent therapy, which I think is the best way of looking at it. Unfortunately, it's also 100% presented akin to suicide and death, and the way you ascend only muddies this idea, and honestly, it makes no fucking sense to me. So, let's break it down. Aftorians don't die. If something happens to them that is considered a killing blow, they don't die, they just ascend. Where presumably they can come back as something new, or they can come back the same, because the paper pleasers were definitely dying before Team Ruby showed up. Jean has a very long, extensive list of chores he needs to do to ensure everyone's safety. There's no way he crafted this whole list in one go without seeing at least one or two of the paper pleasers fall to the misfortune on his list of warnings. So that implies that, let's say Nora, the paper pleaser, got chopped up, but then they ascended and came back again as a paper pleaser again. But there was a point with Jean John's help where they all learned they could be doing better with their pleasing jobs, and they figured out that they were weak and fragile and they wanted to ascend so they could become the genial gems, but John wasn't letting them. They knew how they wanted to change, and they explained the various ways they wanted to ascend. One way was killing themselves, which they ultimately do when they all drown. It's also presented like you can just ascend by getting the rainbow leaves from the tree, which fly all over. And the paper pleasers explained that they tried to get the leaves from the tree, but John kept taking them away. But what's also confusing is that the rainbow leaves also don't make you ascend. Because all four members of Team Ruby, Alex and her brother, and Jean all breathed in the leaves smoke, and that didn't make them ascend. It just gave them visions of something, a person or conflict that they felt was standing in their way, and Team Ruby all turned down their smoke opposite offers. Except for Ruby, who was interrupted before she could come to a decision, but her smoke opposite was saying this. You don't even have to be Ruby Rose. Which is almost the exact same wording as when Ruby decided to ascend. I don't want to be me anymore. This wording implies that if Ruby did take Smoke Ruby's offer, she would have ascended. But we know that's not true because Jean did take his Smoke Opposites offer. He made some sort of deal with Smoke Alex and they shook hands, but then nothing happened to him. He made it out of the smoke and then just helped the others fight. So smoking the leaves doesn't make you ascend, but we also clearly see that eating or drinking the leaves will make you ascend. But also, Neo ascended just by jumping into like a hole in the tree, and I guess she could have grabbed a leaf on the way down and ate it, but it's unclear, so potentially you can just ascend just by falling into a pit in the tree. Oh, and also, the cat can make you ascend. If he touches your heart and your heart has changed, the roots of the tree will take you, but not every time he touches your your heart, this will happen, because he also touched the prince's heart and he didn't ascend. And also the cat dug his claws into Ruby's heart, but despite that looked the same, I think this was just something different. I think this was just an attack of his. So I think this means that the herbalist who did ascend when the cat touched his heart just didn't realize he was ready to ascend. Like how the paper pleasers knew what they wanted to do and how they wanted to change. I think the implication is that the herbalist also had a way he could change for the better and and he just didn't know it. Because when we see him at the end, he definitely has changed, but he didn't know he wanted to ascend or, or something. So, ascension goes like this. If an Aftorian's body is damaged beyond repair, rather than dying, they will ascend. This doesn't apply to humans from Remnant, they just die, and this is not how they ascend. Also, you can drink the rainbow leaves from the tree, but if you smoke the leaves from the tree, it'll just give you a hallucination where you confront someone who represents something that's bothering you. Whether or not this hallucination can result in ascension is unclear, but as far as we seen, it hasn't happened before. Also, if the cat touches your heart, you might ascend depending on certain circumstances. But also, he has a physical attack that looks similar, but doesn't seem to be related to ascension in any way. Also, the cat can't ascend. There's potentially a pit in the center of the tree that might be a part of ascending, but it's unclear if this method is related to one of the other methods or not. Ascension doesn't always result in a change of appearance, and it seems like if that happens, 
happens, you don't lose your memories. Ascension can change your appearance, and it seems like that will take your memories away. Though, we have only seen it happen one way or the other with Afterians and humans separately, so it's unclear if this would work the same way the other way around. So, that's a lot. And every method of ascension comes with some sort of addendum. So is it any wonder people are confused? Not only with the concept of ascension in general, but also the moral lesson presented in Volume 9. Is it any wonder why people think Volume 9 is glorifying suicide? Why it looks like the answer for Ruby solving her problems was to kill herself, or at least self-harm? Quite frankly, I don't know why ascension had to be so fucking complicated, but that's pretty par for the course with Ruby and rooster teeth, huh? Just like with the plot with relics and maidens, just like the ever-expanding origin story of Remnant and Salem, they always make things just too damn complicated for their own good, and it always makes things muddy and questionable. If Ascension was simplified, I think they could have executed their real lesson much easier. Instead, they've accidentally written a story that seems to say suicide is good, a story where we see people desperate to kill themselves, and after their death, it's presented like it's been a positive development for them and the world around them. The idea that if you don't like who you are and you think you can be better, just kill yourself and in your next life you'll be better off. It's horrible and it's a terrible message they've given us and it all seems like they've done it entirely by accident. Remember, it took them over two years to make this volume. They took an extra long amount of time to make sure it was as quality as they wanted it to be. Not to mention the fact that they claim they wrote, or at least started to write Volume 9, the same time they wrote Volume 8. So for years, years, years of writing, years of quality assurance, years and years and years, not once did anyone stop and realize they've written a story that looks like it glorifies suicide. Just because I know that's not what they were trying to do doesn't fix it. It doesn't fix the fact that a lot of people walked away from this volume feeling like that was the message they were trying to send. Now that we see Ruby vanishing away and the rest of her team insists they need to be happy for her. Now that we have a scenario where I was sitting there thinking to myself, God, I hope the paper pleasers managed to kill themselves today. Where death for little only led to an overall positive development for them. Where now I have to think to myself, well, I guess it was a good thing little died. The moral lesson is muddy as hell, because the concept of ascension is muddy as hell. Ascension should have been simplified. Without a doubt, we don't need 17,000 different ways a character can ascend. We don't need a hundred addendums and specifics regarding each method of ascension. These writers need to eventually learn to simplify their key story elements, because this whole mess, this did not need to happen. The fact they've accidentally made this their story is abysmal and disgusting. Get your acts together, guys. Listen, I don't want to put the cart before the horse here, but this volume kind of feels like filler. At the very start of this video, if you can remember that far back, I proposed the question of is this volume filler? And quite frankly, we won't know that until the next volumes come out. There's no way of knowing how much the Ever After will factor into the continual progression of the story at this point in time. However, personally, I don't think it'll really play that much into things. Yes, I 100% think they'll talk about the Ever After. They might address Ruby's ascension. Blake and Yang might explain the reason they started dating. Jean might get dialogue that references the fact he's internally much older. I think it would be adorable if he, Crow, and Ozpin had old man times together, I think that'd actually be very funny. Ruby might name drop somewhat or the blacksmith or other Afterians here and there. But beyond that, I don't see how the Ever After will be all that important. The expansion of the Brother Gods' story doesn't change their current mission, protect the relics and stop Salem. At most, the important thing we might need in reference to the Ever After again is how Summer's weapon got there. But at this point, it's all literally just speculation. I truly don't see any reason as to why any of them would want to return to the Ever After from a character perspective, and from a story perspective, I don't see why we'd need to return either. So in terms of the Ever 
Ever After specifically, it's too early to definitively say anything about it and how it'll play into future volumes. And yes, all five of these characters have had some really substantial development over the course of their time in Volume 9. Well, except for maybe Weiss. <laughs> but is it filler? On one hand, no. Character growth is never filler. No, we might not be able to tell if the Ever After is specifically filler or not, but in terms of, like, the overarching plot, the real story of Ruby, uh, yeah, <laughs> this all felt like filler. We don't address Salem, or the relics, or the maidens at all this volume. Every time a character started to bring up one of those elements, they got interrupted and sidelined. How are you even supposed to stop her now that Atlas is gone? Maybe we shouldn't worry about home right now. We've got enough problems to- The cat! <laughs> she doesn't know where the beacon relic is. Well, there's that to be thankful for, at least. Are you done? We need to move before the weather turns. And we could have had the Ever After be the main setting for this volume, and still develop the actual main plot of the volumes at the same time. Maybe have the girls address a game plan of what to do now that Cinder has two of the relics. Have a moment where they sit down and talk about what Salem might do with Ambrosius's creation. Have them game plan about going to Vacuo or going back to Beacon and finding the lost relic of choice. Talk about if they stay in Vacuo, how can they make sure it's not a repeat of Atlas? Talk about Winter being the Winter Maiden now. Talk about finding the Summer Maiden to protect Vacuo's vault. Discuss the possibility of finding Raven again to help them with her maiden powers. Literally, any of these things, any of the moments where a character was just sitting around, they could have been talking about this stuff, and it would have felt like we were still interacting with the real story of the show. Just because they've decided to isolate the main characters away from the plot physically, that doesn't mean they needed to ignore everything about the main plot from a character point of view. These characters have mouths, they can speak, they can talk and plan at the very least, but no. Instead, we've quietly ignored the story of the show because I guess RT couldn't figure out how to balance character development and plot progression at the same time. That's the thing that makes me inclined to call this volume filler. Like, think about this. When Ruby as a show is completely finished, and we all talk about the plot of Ruby, will we even talk about Volume 9? Oh yeah, and then there's that weird volume that took place in Wonderland. We waited over two years to get this volume, and it didn't even attempt to touch on all of the things they left us off with at the end of Volume 8. There was no Salem, no relics, no maidens, nothing. Yeah, the characters grew and developed, Ruby had her depression arc, Jean got his time-related trauma, Blake and Yang got confirmed for their relationship. Like, even now, only a short while after the volume's conclusion, I've seen no one really talking about it. It's hard to talk about this volume, because, like... We're all still speculating on the Summer Maiden. We're all still talking about the fall of Atlas. We're wondering what happened to Team Honor in Vacuo. This volume actively ignored all of those things. And so, just like how I can't put the cart before the horse when talking about the impact the Ever After will have until I see the next volume, I also have to just wait for next time to finally see the actual plot continuing to develop, because they refused to do that here. So, here's where we're left off. An undeterminate amount of time has seemingly passed, and our heroes are entering Vacuo, finally. Have they been gone for three days? Three weeks? Three years? Three decades? We have no idea what happened to Team Honor in the Sandstorm. We don't know. Has Salem used the Staff of Creation? We don't know. Has Crow figured out where everyone went? Is he still with Robin and the Aesops? We don't know. Looking ahead at volume 10 feels like one big question mark. I don't know what to expect. I don't know what's going to change. I don't even know how long it's going to take. It took over two years to get volume 9. I don't even know if we'll actually be getting volume 10 yet. Volume 9 is a weird, weird, weird volume. It's gone in so many directions that I just don't quite understand. I don't know why we had to be in a fairy tale. I don't know why Jean had to age so much without the others. I don't know what's going to happen next, and I don't even know where to begin in terms of speculation. A lot of things are changing with Ruby, production-wise at least. Rooster Teeth is not doing as good as they used to. It's come to light just how terrible of a company they are, and how they've abused their animators and staff, overflowing with bigots, and I don't know what the future of RT looks like. I'm expecting someone to buy them out, gut the higher-ups, and keep making Ruby since it's their biggest moneymaker, but also, 
this volume was weird. It's only available to watch as a paid membership on Crunchyroll until a year after its original air date, then it's said to finally release on Rooster Teeth's website a whole year later. Who's willing to wait that long? Volume 8 ended up being really bad, and I know I definitely didn't want to spend money to watch a show that might be as bad as that one, and I know I'm not the only one who felt that way. So a lot of people either didn't watch it or they just pirated it. And the ones who did watch Volume 9 was faced with concerning questions about how it's handled the topics of suicide. So I don't know. Quite frankly, I do not know what the future of Ruby will look like. I hope this isn't the end of Ruby, because this would be a pretty disappointing way to end things off. A story left unfinished and just when things were really actually starting to get good again. The animation is some of its best here. The final episodes is really breathtaking. I've been looking forward to seeing Vacuo literally since the first time we ever heard about it. I love the desert. I've been waiting to see the desert setting in Ruby for so long. No, the books don't count. They're boring and I don't like E.C. Myers' writing style. <laughs> so yeah, kind of like the volume itself, it's all just kind of weird right now. Volume 9 wasn't a bad volume by any means, but it also wasn't an amazing volume. Personally, I would rank it somewhere in the middle of the list, which makes it hard to really definitively say something about it in the end. It's easy when I can just say, this volume is one of the bests ever, or this volume is one of the worsts ever. But when something is just okay, it has some really great moments, but also some really not great moments, like... There it is. <laughs> That's it. Not as good as I wanted it to be, but it could have been worse. It's a bit of a bummer to get a just good volume after such a long wait. Like, yeah, it's really great at times, but it's also really not great at other times. It's messy. It's weird. It doesn't handle every topic the way I think they wanted to or should have. And I don't know where we're going to go from here. And I've said a lot at this point, and I don't know what else I can say. So, I guess that's it. So yeah, that's that's the end. That's the end of the very long volume 9 review. It's a weird one. It's very weird. A lot of high highs, a lot of low lows, and it's hard to rank it because of that, and it's hard to talk about it because it's all over the place. I know the fandom has been rather divided on the concepts presented in Volume 9, and I would love to hear what you all think. Do you like it? Do you not like it? I totally understand both sides of, of this coin. The people who love it, I get it. The people who hate it, I get it. Uh, about the things I talked about, I talked about so many things. I wanted to be as thorough as I could. Let me know what you think as well. <laughs> your thoughts, your opinions, Smoke Cloud, the characters, the comedy, the animation, anything. There are so many points. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions. And I'll see you in the next one. My throat is sore. I've been talking for a very long time. I started at 9.30 and now it is 1. It's... Oh, <laughs> no wonder my throat hurts. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you made it all the way to the end here. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.